TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Talk TV News at 10. Good morning, I'm Nadira Tudor. The Education Secretary is insisting that the Prime Minister has not intervened with the Sue Gray report. Boris Johnson remains under pressure to explain a secret meeting with the senior civil servant over her investigation into Partygate. Nadim Zahawi says he's unaware who called the meeting or what was discussed, but insisted the process has been robust. Ukraine's warning that agreeing to a ceasefire with Russia would risk them hitting back harder. The country has ruled out making a deal with Vladimir Putin, with President Zelensky's advisers insisting that making any concessions would backfire. Russian forces are being told to leave Ukraine before the peace process can continue. Meanwhile, Russian forces have continued their attacks on the eastern Donbass region following their capture of Mariupol. Ministry of Defense Intelligence say that the country's only operational Terminator tank is likely likely to have been sent to the region as part of the offensive. Australia's Labour Party leader, Anthony Albanese, has said he wants to unite the country and work on changing the climate policy. The centre-left politician has said that the country would become a renewable energy superpower. He'll be sworn in as PM tomorrow. My Labour team will work every day to bring Australians together. And I will lead a government worthy of the people of Australia. Joe Biden is warning that everyone should be concerned about the monkeypox outbreak. The president of the U.S. says the country is looking into vaccines and treatments after 120 confirmed or suspected cases were reported across the globe. 20 of those cases are in Britain. Survivors of the Manchester Arena terror attack and Mayor Andy Burnham will take part in a race through the city to mark the fifth anniversary. There'll be an applaud for the 22 victims ahead of the race and church bells will ring at 10.31pm. The time a bomb was detonated at the Ariana Grande concert back in 2017. Talk TV spoke to Paul Price who survived the attack but tragically lost his partner Elaine. The future is still frightening for me. Um... It's still, you know, there's so many struggles for me. One of them is loneliness. I've got lots of people to do stuff with, but I've got no one to do nothing with. And ministers are looking at making it illegal for rail staff to strike unless there are a certain number of employees on shift. The RMT union is balloting 40,000 members, including network rail staff and 15 train operating companies. The transport secretary has told the Sunday Telegraph it's time for unions to wake up and smell the coffee, suggesting walkouts could put more people off the trains. Now, time for today's weather. Times Travel sponsors Talk TV Weather. It will be rather cloudy in the northwest with outbreaks of patchy rain, especially across western Scotland. Drier and brighter elsewhere, the best of the sunshine being across the southeast of England. Zooming in, and we can see it will be cloudy with outbreaks of rain across northern and western Scotland. Although some sunny spells are likely through the central belt, but some locally heavy showers are also possible here. Some sun with scattered showers across Northern Ireland, but cloud and patchy rain for Northern England. Some patchy rain is likely for Western Wales, but drier in the east and across the Midlands. Southern parts of England will be dry with plenty of prolonged sunny spells, especially in the southeast, where it will be warm in the sunshine, remaining cloudy with patchy rain in the northwest, drier and brighter elsewhere, with sunshine and showers. Trust us to take you there. Times Travel sponsors Talk TV Weather. The Sunday Night Club is your club. I'll take you inside the dressing room, from the terraces to the boardroom, to ask the questions you want answered. There is no membership required for the Sunday Night Club from 7. And a very good morning to one and all. Yes, it is mid-morning, Sunday the 22nd of May. It's a glorious day out there, whether you're still in bed, whether you're making the breakfast, or whether you're out and about. Uh, I hope you'll stay with me for the next three hours. We have got a full-on, action-packed 
show. There really is. We might even have to cancel the news bulletins. We've got so much to talk about. In the first hour, yes, I'm going to be talking about how our taxpayers' cash is being used to campaign against the government, to sue the government, to sue us. Unbelievable. In particular, against the Rwanda policy. I want to talk about energy prices, the risk of them rising over the next few months. And my big interview this morning is, yes, with the General Secretary, Mick Lynch, of the RMT about these huge, bullying, threatening strikes that we're reading about in the newspapers. In the second hour, then we're going to be talking about the NHS's increasing dependency on China for critical medical supplies. I'm not very happy about that. The risk of grain shortages, food shortages, which is being talked about. And this is a big, big Sunday in the footballing world. It is, of course, the last day of the Premier League. Some vital games going on including my beloved Liverpool. And then in the third hour, I've got this exclusive interview live here in the studio with the two instructors who took some severely injured combat veterans. They took them skydiving, not just uh, you know, in one of the shire counties of the UK. No, no, they took them to Nepal and they skydived above Mount Everest out of a helicopter. Just imagine that. Would you be prepared to do that? That and so much more. We've got some great guests throughout the show. And my big question to you, given these threats of strikes, what would you do? Would you be happy automating more of our trains to reduce the risk of rail strikes? Or indeed, should we ban rail strikes on the tube and the railways? Because actually, it's part of our critical national infrastructure. I want your calls, your views, your thoughts on that, because I want to then put them to Mick Lynch. So give us a call, 0344 499 1000, or of course you can text us, 87222 using the word talk, or tweet us, at Talk TV. So many ways to get involved, and that of course is what makes a much more interesting, interactive show. So don't hold back, but for now, you're listening to Tice Talk, here on Talk TV. And that, of course, signals the moment for my Sunday sermon, the moment when I can share my thoughts, occasional frustrations and occasional rant and feel better for it. And likewise, when you call me, hopefully you'll feel better for releasing your thoughts and your anxieties. Uh, I may not be able to cure them all, but we'll certainly listen. And you remember last week I talked about government waste and the need perhaps to save £5 in every 100 in order to be able to give tax cuts to help resolve the cost of living crisis. But unfortunately, what I learned this week, as if by sort of negative magic, I've learned about how our taxpayers' cash, some £50 million worth, just in the last couple of years, has been given by civil servants, with or without minister's knowledge, I'm not sure, given to lobbying and political organisations so that they can lobby against the government, against the, the elected representatives of the day, that we the people put them in there to carry out their manifesto. And yet these lobbying groups are using our cash to sue the government. Can you believe it? Imagine running your own business. Would you give your cash from your business to another organisation so they can use your money to sue you and your product? I mean, I can't imagine anything that is more utterly bonkers, giving money to someone else, our money, so that they can sue us. It is unbelievable. Yet this is happening every week, every month. So on the uh, Rwanda migrant policy, which we want to work, but is being delayed and delayed and may never work, the government has given over the last three years over £7.5 million to organisations who are actively fighting and campaigning against this government scheme to resettle the illegal migrants. Yes, the likes of Migrant Help, Stonewall, Refugee Action, Hope Not Hate, Instalaw. They, between them, have either signed letters or instigated legal action alongside the Public Civil Servants Union. Yes, the Civil Servants' own union suing us through the government against the government policy. You really could not make it up. It's unbelievable. Giving money to organisations and charities who are using it to
to then sue the government and to delay enacting this activity, this government policy. I'll give you another example. In a different area, we're giving tens of millions of pounds to a group, for example, you may have heard of, the NHS Confederation. We're giving them £9 million a year, and that's just a lobbying group, essentially. And they spent most of the two years of COVID campaigning for more lockdowns, supposedly to protect the NHS. Well, that didn't work very well, did it? I mean, we know that actually the NHS is in a worse state, not hasn't been protected, with no care, no care from the NHS Confederation for the collateral damage that lockdowns did to patients suffering cancer or lung disease or heart disease, so many other ailments, who've died years early, and yet we're giving them nine million quid a year. Is it really a good use of our cash to give over two million pounds in the last couple of years to the Association of Directors of Public Health? That sounds like a quango if ever I've heard of one. In inverted commas, to make sure that the voices of the directors of public health are being heard by policymakers. Close inverted commas. Really? Is that a good use of your cash, our heard and our heard earned cash at this difficult time? These are quite simply huge bureaucratic quangos that should be shut down and abolished. Oh, before I forget, three hundred grand to gendered intelligence that is campaigning to allow under sixteens to consent themselves to bodily medical treatments. Now this is just, I'm literally just scratching what I call the pimple on the bloated skin of grotesque government waste and incompetence. And this, folks, is just one of the reasons why we've got the highest taxes for 70 years, the worst, the least productive public services for 70 years. We need to cut taxes we need to cut daft regulation, we need to go for growth, and we want our public services to work efficiently, promptly, and much faster. I think we can do so much better, but we're not going to do it if we give lots of our cash to these bureaucratic quangos. And with that, here endeth this week's Sunday Sermon. Well, there we are. That is just uh, some of my uh, anxieties and frustrations this week. But give me a call, 0344 499 1000, to share your concerns. Have I got it right? Am I being unfair? Is it a good use of our money to give it to these uh, lobbying groups who then sue us? So give us a call or send us a tweet or a, uh, a text message so that, you know, you can feel, feel better, hopefully, by releasing your anxieties. Now... I just want to have a quick update on my Sunday sermon from a couple of weeks ago. You may remember, I talked about what was going on in Tower Hamlets with the newly elected mayor and this new political party, Aspire. And I highlighted some issues that I felt needed addressing and I've written to the Electoral Commission. Well, interestingly, this week just gone, an independent electoral monitoring group called Democracy Volunteers, they've produced a 16-page document highlighting some of the issues that they found because they were monitoring many or all of the polling stations on election day in Tower Hamlets. And they've submitted their detailed findings to the Electoral Commission. Now, there's some shocking reading in there, I have to tell you. There is some extraordinary stuff. There's also some acceptable practice, and they've quite rightly highlighted where things are working, and that's good news. But bluntly, in what should be the mother of all democracies... So it jolly well should work. It really should be as near perfect as possible. We've had enough practice. But instead what they find is that in a third of polling stations, about a third of polling stations, there is evidence of what they call family voting. That may sound cosy, but that's where a member of the family, almost always a male, is in the polling booth directing another family member, almost always a female, where to put their vote. That is not right. There's also been evidence of intimidation of staff, possible personation, intimidation outside the polling station. I saw some bad stuff last year that I reported in Tower Hamlets. There's examples of party activists 
leading multiple electors into polling stations at different times in different polling stations throughout the day. Really? Why can't people actually go themselves to the polling station so that they can cast their vote themselves in private, as it should be? Something is not right. More evidence in this report from Democracy Volunteers, where at the count, counting agents of political parties, whilst they are allowed to, to monitor what's going on during the count, instead, they were angrily, aggressively harassing the council counting staff. There are multiple occasions where these party counting agents were literally hitting the plastic COVID screens and raising their voices and shouting at the counting staff. I mean, this is an independent electoral monitoring group. This is their report that they're submitting to the Electoral Commission of what's going on in one borough in what should be, what we like to think is the greatest capital city in the world in 2022. You might think this might have gone on 100 years ago. No, 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 this is now. This is real. And for my mind, it's unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. I want your thoughts on that. Give us a call, 0344 499 1000, or text us, or tweet us. You know, have I got this right? Am I being too harsh? Maybe, maybe that's the way to increase turnout. Maybe I've got this wrong. Or maybe actually there is something seriously wrong with some of our electoral processes. I want your thoughts, your views, and after the break, we'll be talking to Harry Fone from the Taxpayers' Alliance about this continuing waste of our taxpayers' cash. Because I'm absolutely clear, we can get our way out of this cost of living crisis quite easily. We can cut taxes hard. And the way to pay for it, folks, is also relatively easy. We stop wasting taxpayers' cash by useless, incompetent, unproductive government spending. Let me know your thoughts. You are listening, of course, to the home of common sense. It is Ty's Talk, and this is live from the Talk Radio studios. It's Talk TV.
Welcome back, my friends, to Tice Talk this glorious Sunday morning. And already, some of you, I think, are as frustrated as me about what's going on, uh, either with the RMT or the waste of taxpayers' cash. Phil here, he says, it's the RMT who are the real bullies. Ronald Reagan had the right idea in the 1980s when he sacked the striking air traffic controllers. I'm old enough to remember that, and that's absolutely right. Uh, he took them on and he won the day, a bit like Thatcher with the miners. And actually, you know, my view with the RMT, this could be their last big strike if they go ahead with it. This could be Mick Lynch's Arthur Scargill moment. Let me know your thoughts. Lucy here, she has twe tweeted in, not tweeted in, try again, uh, the armed services are not allowed to strike, the railways are a critical industry, they should not be allowed to strike either. Uh, the same with the police and the NHS. Do you know what, Lucy, I think many of you, uh, I agree with that. I think many, many people agree with that. These are our public services that we pay for, and some of it is critical to the functioning of a decent United Kingdom. And we should stop wa wasting our taxpayers' cash, and in particular, giving it to people who are then going to sue us. I mean, you really couldn't make it up. And this actually was exposed by the Taxpayers' Alliance in a brilliant report they did. So I'm delighted now to be joined on the phone by their campaign manager, Harry Phone. Harry, are you there? No, we've lost Harry. Harry has uh, obviously um, disappeared. But uh, instead, we've got our first caller of the morning. Christine, hello. Good morning. How are you doing? Oh, good morning, Richard. Yes, I'm fine, thank you. Good, good. Um, are you happy with everything that's going on or are you frustrated like me? Uh, well, actually, I travel by train very regularly down to Cornwall, across to Haverford West in West Wales. Lovely. Uh, and most of the time I travel by Great Western um, or the Welsh train companies and uh, cross-country trains. Now, the fact that every single uh, rail operator is join, proposing to join in this strike, I think that, you know, I fully support the rail workers because they're proposing to have more and more unmanned stations, which I think is dreadful. And we do need people on the trains because there are often troublemakers on trains. Yes, no, that, that, and that's a really good point, Christine. Um, but the question is, I mean, you take, for example, the Docklands Light Railway, uh, that's unmanned trains, they work perfectly acceptably. So is it about um, perhaps focusing the, uh, the customer care, as I think you're suggesting, on the trains themselves, you know, looking after customers and, and preventing any antisocial behaviour? Yes, I, I'm talking about the National Rail Network yes. as opposed to London trains and tube trains. I'm talking about, you know, the rest of the country. But are, are you happy that they could strike if they, if they haven't, you know, they're not happy with their paying conditions? But, but I don't blame them because... Really? No, I don't blame them. Uh, they're going to get rid of loads of maintenance jobs. I mean, hundreds of maintenance jobs. And they're saying they want to save money because the passion of people working and there are more people working from home. Well, yeah, there are at the moment, but that's going to change. But, but Christine, don't, don't you think that, like any industry, you have to adapt to the current circumstances? You can't guarantee no redundancies. You can't guarantee no changes to working practices to make you a bit more efficient, a bit more productive, uh, and to actually perform. I think it's very short-sighted. And when they make all these people redundant, they're all going to have to go on benefits. You know, and but, also... But you, you, know, you say that, you, you say that, but actually, currently, for example, uh, we've actually got more job vacancies than we've got people unemployed, which is an extraordinary and quite unique situation. But, you know... The, yes, you know why that is, don't you? Because the pay that they're being offered is far too low. I have a local pub here... And, and it's at the, it's literally on the verge of closing down. But the pay that they're getting offered is, is not enough to live on. And people will not accept jobs with very low pay. There's no point. You're better off on benefits. Well, well clearly, clearly that the system is not properly designed. If no. the pay rates are worse than the benefits, then that's a fundamental yeah, that, that, that's that a fundamental problem. The but but the, the market works. If you can't find someone for the for the job, then you have to either. You have, to pay, uh, you, have to, you have to pay more, that's absolutely fine. Um, we've yeah. got to go, Christine, but I'm so grateful for your thoughts and sharing that with me. That's Christine, who believes that actually they have got the right to strike and that, uh, in a sense, there shouldn't be any redundancies of uh, any of the rail staff. Uh, meanwhile, we've got Harry back, I think, on the line. Harry, good morning to you. Are you with me this uh, Sunday morning on Ties Talk? 
Good morning, Richard. I am indeed. How are you this morning? Excellent. Well, I'm I'm just about OK. But your report uh, this week, and I have to congratulate you on you highlighting about 50 million quid's worth of our cash, our hard-earned cash, um, that civil servants and government departments have been giving to uh, lobbying groups and political organisations in order that they can campaign against the government and against us and, indeed, on many occasions, sue us. I mean, I just find that uh, shocking, extraordinary and, in a sense, um, just just totally unjustified and a waste of money. But uh, um, uh, how, you know, how serious is this? Is this just scratching the surface, what you've discovered so far? Well, yes, to a certain extent it is because, um, you know, this is, we haven't been able to necessarily trawl all the data as of yet. Um, just to bring your listeners up to date, so we've discovered that since 2018, £49 million of public money, and that's a £19 million of which was during the COVID pandemic, um, that's been used to fund groups um, such as Migrant Help, Stonewall and Refugee Action, um, who have then actively uh, fought against, you know, the government's uh, policies, for example, the scheme to resettle uh, migrants in Rwanda. So you end up with this ridiculous situation where effectively taxpayers have funded um, organisations uh, to then lecture and lobby the government. It's a it's a needless uh, merry-go-round and particularly insulting, I think, when, you know, the government has just hiked uh, national insurance and uh, we've seen the freezing of the income tax thresholds because the government, you know, claims it needs more money. Well, here's an example of tens of millions of pounds that didn't need to be spent. And do you think that ministers know and approve of this spending? Or do you think that actually civil servants are granting it without bringing it to the attention of ministers and secretaries of state? I mean, it's hard to say. Uh, I mean, the cynic in me would possibly say yes to that question. Of course, you know, um, you would hope that things like this, that ministers do have the final uh, sign-off on. In fact, they, they probably should if they don't. Um, I, I don't think it's unfair to say, based on conversations I've had with people that work in the civil, servants, civil service, that there is definitely a difference in civil servants' political leanings compared to the, the government um, of the day. So um, perhaps it is the case, um, although we don't know for definite that, that these things are, are snuck through. But, but whatever, however it's being done, it is completely unacceptable that taxpayers are, are funding I, um, I, the interests of these groups. I mean, I said last week that in the same way that, you know, with our personal household budgets, many people are saying, well, I need to save five, six, seven pounds in every hundred that actually the government should be doing that with government spending and, and looking to save 50 billion quid a year of the trillion that they spend every year. Um, you, I mean, you do a great job looking at this stuff. There's clearly a lot more uh, to find. The idea, for example, the, the, the NHS Confederation, a sort of NHS lobbying group, being given nine million quid a year uh, to lobby against government policy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, how many how many nurses does that pay for? An, an awful lot is the answer. Um, you know, similarly, we did some research a couple of years ago now, um, just, again, just scratching the surface, looking at wasteful spending, you know, from local to national government and quangos and all sorts of things like that, and we found £5.7 billion. Pounds. Um, you know, similarly, we've also done some research looking at some uh, some ways you can, uh, you can save money, things like, you know, uh, regional pay bargaining and um, many things like that that, you know, you, you soon get into the tens of billions of pounds. So, well, you know, rather than this idea of government dipping into our pockets all the time, they should look at their own finances and try and make some cutbacks. Well, they need to treat it as though they're spending our money and start saving it. Harry, thank you so much for those thoughts. That's Harry Phone, the campaign manager for the Taxpayers Alliance. They do a great job, uh, essentially trying to check that the government's not wasting money. We all know they do waste money. Uh, Lucy says, I totally agree with you about this, Richard. Uh, we should, uh, what does she say here? Uh, she says that we should stop wasting taxpayers' money. Uh, I'll come back to that. Stay with us after the break. You're listening here to Ty's Talk, here on Talk TV. If my friends had to describe me, I don't know, maybe you should ask them, but I think, or I hope they would say, I am the life and the soul of the party. I'll arrive, things get going, things get done. I'm a doer. They'd say that. They'd also say I'm glass <laughs> half full. <laughs> I look for the positive things in people's lives, in what's going on. But also, I think they'd say I'm passionate. I'm passionate about what I do, what I support, what I believe in. This is Talk TV News. 
Good morning, I'm Nadira Tudor. The Education Secretary is insisting that the Prime Minister has not intervened with the Sue Gray report. Boris Johnson remains under pressure to explain a secret meeting with the senior civil servant over her investigation into Partygate. Nadim Zahami says he's unaware who called the meeting or what was discussed, but insisted the process has been robust. Ukraine's warning that agreeing to a ceasefire with Russia would risk them hitting back harder. The country has ruled out making a deal with Vladimir Putin, with President Zelensky's advisers insisting that making any concessions would backfire. Russian forces are being told to leave Ukraine before the peace process can continue. Meanwhile, Russian forces have continued their attacks on the eastern Donbass region following their capture of Mariupol. Ministry of Defence Intelligence say that the country's only operational Terminator tank is likely to have been sent to the region as part of the offensive. Joe Biden is warning that everyone should be concerned about the monkeypox outbreak. The president of the U.S. says the country is looking into vaccines and treatments after 120 confirmed or suspected cases were reported across the globe. 20 of those cases are in Britain. And Australia's Labour Party leader, Anthony Albanese, has said he wants to unite the country and work on changing the climate policy. The centre-left politician has said that the country could become a renewable energy superpower. He'll be sworn in as PM tomorrow, but the party is still 76 seats short of a majority. My Labour team will work every day to bring Australians together. And I will lead a government worthy of the people of Australia. That's all for now. We'll have more in half an hour. Welcome back to Ties Talk here on Talk TV. We are halfway through the first hour of a busy show. We've just been talking about the waste of taxpayers' cash. I mean, it's bad enough as wasted anywhere. But when it's actually wasted giving money to people who are then going to sue the government on our behalf, it just feels particularly egregious. Lots of messages and concerns coming in about what's going on in Tower Hamlets. I should just say, I have invited the newly elected mayor, Lutva Raman, on uh, every single week of the last three weeks to come and have a chat and to talk about these concerns and maybe he can put our, our issues and anxieties at rest. Every single week, uh, no reply, no response no comment but there we are we also now need to move on to a different issue which is something that's concerning us all which is the price of energy and we all know what's happened to our bills this april they've gone up there's talk of them going up uh, even more in october i'm really concerned that that price rise is actually baked in but what's driving this and heaven forbid could it get even worse we need to really understand uh, the geopolitical impact and forces of this energy crisis. I'm delighted now to be joined by Andy Mayer, who is the uh, energy analyst at the Institute for Economic Affairs, to discuss this. Good morning, Andy. Thanks for joining us on Ty's Talk. Well, these are uncomfortable times for everybody when we look at our energy bills, gas bills, electricity bills, and you think, how did this happen? Um, we are where we are. Uh, m my concern, Andy, is, is what's the impact of the sanctions against Russia, which I fully support in terms of reducing buying Russian gas, reducing buying Russian oil, uh, the, the, the ability of other parts of the world to replace that supply, how quickly that can come on stream and therefore how, how severe an effect that may have on, on pricing in the next six to 12 months or so. Well, the answer the markets are currently giving to that question is different for oil and gas. And obviously, gas affects heating and oil affects transport, though the stuff you're putting in your tank of petrol. With Russia, the gas price is crucial. We have a regional gas market in Europe. And it's not possible at the current time to replace that Russian gas if you're living in Germany or parts of Eastern Europe. Uh, the hope in the longer term is that the other uh, non-aligned OPEC countries and OPEC themselves will increase supply uh, to replace what is then being taken offline by sanctions against Russia. But that's not guaranteed. I mean, there are occasionally tensions between Saudi Arabia and Russia that can be exploited in order to bring that about. But that really is where, it, where the major source of new supply could come from. Most of the other OPEC members are tiny, uh, with the possible exception of Iran, who's not currently in OPEC, or rather has been suspended. 
because of the sanctions against them by the Americans. So there's an enormous number of different geopolitical forces at work that could actually change in order to answer that question. But what the market's saying at the moment is the gas price is going to go up to about 240. It's currently about 140 at the moment, which, to be clear, is six to seven times higher than it normally is. And, and then we'll fall back again by 2025. 2025? 140. Wow. So, uh, this, and this is my concern. I think people, and particularly in government, are being incredibly naive stroke stupid, thinking that this is a temporary spike for just a few months. But as I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, it's much harder to increase the supply of gas from the likes of Qatar and indeed to transport it because you've got to use these uh, liquefied natural gas ships and there's only a limited supply of those and limited facilities that you can actually dock them in. Well, that's true. Um, the global fleet for energy is higher than it's ever been and is in reasonably good shape. But the issue is really the terminals. So the current oddity where the UK gas price is lower than the European gas price is due to the fact that LNG cargoes are arriving in the UK, can't be stored here because we never invested in gas storage, um, and are going then out as fast as they can to the European market. But that's creating a price differential. We don't want them here. We want them in Europe in the summer, and that position will reverse in winter when we really want it. Uh, we can get more from Qatar, but you are right. It is limited by the size of that fleet. And it's very unclear if you've got a government that's constantly preaching about net zero why anybody would invest in that. I mean, one of the difficulties we have is not just with the use of the international markets in order to um, bridge this gap. It's with the domestic market as well. So the North Sea, for example, currently could be producing a lot more. If we'd actually let fracking happen about five, six years ago, we would currently have a domestic source of supply there and possibly spaces in the ground to store things uh, when those were depleted. So this is absolutely... So all those things would help. This, Andy, is absolutely vital because you've just confirmed that the gas price in the UK is much lower than the gas price in Europe. And yet MP after MP after minister after minister trot out this garbage that we're subject to world markets. But actually, the evidence is not. The evidence is, if you've got more supply in your domestic market, which we could have if we had North Sea gas and we had shale gas, which I'm a big fan of, then actually we could have a lower price, uh, rather like they see in the domestic US gas markets. Well, that's certainly true temporarily. I mean, obviously, these anomalies in the prices do adjust over time. So, for example, the US price is now shooting up because the US is shipping out LNG to us. Um, so we could help ourselves by creating those storage reserves. We do have strategic oil reserves, about 60 days, for example. So it's an oddity that we don't have strategic gas reserves. And the government is dithering and has been dithering for 10 years about what to do about that. It's always been reliant previously on the North Sea to turn on the taps when it needed them. I mean, I just find it mind-boggling. And, and yes, the US gas price has increased, but it's still way below ours. Uh, and that's, as I understand, primarily because they're, you know, they're essentially extracting uh, significant quantities of shale gas, and we've got this treasure under our feet. We could have much lower prices uh, and use it domestically. Yes, we can, and it would help. It would certainly relieve the projected rises in the energy price cap towards winter. Um, but we shouldn't assume that it would be a complete solution because it's very difficult to try and restrict the UK to only using gas for ourselves. But we are connected to the wider gas grid in Europe. We are connected by the LNG terminals. And you can create a situation where it's stickier, more difficult to move around, but you can't create a situation where you can guarantee that you'd have low prices in the UK. No, but, but what, doing nothing is the worst of all options. Doing nothing is the worst of all options. Not having a sufficient... Uh, capacity for gas storage so that you can uh, you can essentially try and sort of even out the market uh, feels to me uh, as you say it's dither and delay completely unnecessarily but and you can have you know long-term government contracts or you know supply contracts purchase contracts as well can't you you can um but again the the issue with the uk is if you were an investor and you wanted to invest in onshore drilling or in the north sea or in storage, would you look at the rhetoric that the government is currently putting out about trying to get rid of all this stuff and say, yeah, I'm going to risk my money with you guys when you can't even decide whether or not you're going to have a windfall tax every other year, every time the price spikes? So the UK government's got an awful lot of work to do if it wants to convince anybody that it's going to help the UK with its strategic storage or strategic gas supply problem. 
Yeah, and that's a fair point because, of course, they said to the uh, the shale gas industry that uh, we'll create this new industry and give you consents, uh, and then they bottled it at the first sign of a few eco zealots protesting outside the uh, outside the drilling wells. Well, it was even worse than that. I mean, the government, I think, is reasonably sound now about dealing with Extinction Rebellion and treating them um, as the slightly illegal protesters that they are and they will remove people. But actually, what fooled them on fracking was the seismology. Yes. They got obsessed with the idea you could have completely safe drilling operations everywhere that nobody would ever feel, ever. Exactly. And well, that's we, unrealistic. Well, they've got a review on over the next three months. It'll be interesting to see how that progresses. Uh, Andy Mayer from the IA, thank you so much for those thoughts about energy prices, the concerns about the forecast. Coming up after the break, don't miss it, don't go anywhere. We've got Mick Lynch, General Secretary of the RMT, to talk about the general strike. It's Ty's Talk, Talk TV. Welcome back to Ty's Talk this Sunday morning. We're well into the first hour of the show. Lots of tweets and messages coming in. Give us a call 0344 499 1000 with your thoughts, concerns or joys and delights of what is going on. Uh, meanwhile, the papers are full of stories that there could be a huge, 
huge rail strike this summer, potentially including the Jubilee weekend, some describing it as potentially the biggest strike since the general strike of back in the 1920s. Uh, I'm not quite old enough to remember that. But um, I thought I wanted to try and establish what it's all about, and there's no one better to get to the truth of what uh, what really is going on and what are the concerns of the rail workers than uh, the General Secretary of the RMT Union, Mick Lynch himself, who is on the... Uh, on the TV screens now. Uh, Mick, a very good morning to you. Thank you for joining us on Talk TV. Just a few weeks ago, I was very much with you guys and girls on the issue of the P&O ferry. Uh, outrage, uh, what went on there, and I'm sh I know that's, that's ongoing. Um, but w what's going on here? Uh, it, have you just done a brilliant job of sort of raising the issue in the press and actually you're going to be nice and friendly around the negotiating table or, or is it for real is there really going to be uh strikes and a tube strike during the jubilee weekend when we're celebrating uh, you know the queen's jubilee well we're always professional uh, around the negotiating table richard and always very uh, uh friendly when we can be but we've got some serious issues the jubilee line strike is at one one station one set of stations a cluster of stations where we've got a manager that's behaving in a bullying way. But the, the bigger action that you're referring to is a national dispute with Network Rail, which obviously is in Scotland, England and Wales, so the whole of Britain, um, and 15 of the train operating companies that are controlled by the Department for Transport. And the issues there are jobs. So they are seeking to cut thousands of jobs from the railway system. That's from engineering to ticket offices, catering on board in the stations thousands of our members' jobs going. They are seeking to strip out our terms and conditions that we've negotiated over decades with the railway companies. And they've also imposed a pay freeze for the last two years, and we're going into the third year of that pay freeze. And our members, like everybody else, are suffering uh, at the moment with the rocket in prices. Retail price index last week was 11.1%, which, me which is the measure that includes housing, and most people want to live in a house, you might, or in a home at least, in my experience. So we've got a cluster of issues that we want to negotiate with the companies with. We've put on a ballot for 16 of those companies. Those come in on Tuesday. There's an opportunity then to negotiate, and we will do that. Uh, and we started some discussions with some of the companies already. If we can get a settlement, there'll be no need for these disputes. But, but do you not think that... We can't get a settlement. Uh, look, we, we will we, have to take industrial action. Yeah, but, but, but in essence, as I understand... Their jobs, their pay and their conditions. But from what I read, there's, there's a, a requirement for a guarantee that there will be no redundancies and, and no changes to working practices. I mean, no industry uh, I anywhere across the whole of society, across the whole of the, uh, the country, uh, can guarantee no changes. Uh, you know, we, we've got to modernise, you've got to adapt to current circumstances. So surely that's an unreasonable request. We all understand about the inflation pressures, but the idea that you, you, you can't accept there could be any changes to working practices or... Uh, you know, potential modernisation, in investment in equipment, which means less jobs. Is that fair and reasonable? Well, we're not asking for a guarantee of no change, and we're not even a, a asking for a guarantee of no job losses. We're seeking a guarantee of no compulsory redundancies, which we think is achievable. The railway has been evolving and modernising since the day it came in, since Stevenson's rocket uh, in the 1830s, and we've our members have dealt with change all through. And we've got agreements with the companies that deal with those changes, technology advances, cha even changes in usage. Uh, so we're ready to do that. And technology is obviously affecting most jobs, uh, virtually every job in society. And we will deal with that. OK, so you, you accept there's the need for change, and maybe there's some wrong reporting about this, but some, you know, the operating companies say that you haven't even started negotiating yet, and yet you've got well, these... That's because... You've That's got because they won't and... come to the table with a set of proposals. They've told us what their principles are. For instance, they've got a principle that every booking office in Britain will close in every single station. That is thousands of booking offices and thousands of jobs. And that means that people who need passenger assistance, such as uh, people who might have vision problems, people who, who may have disabilities, uh, and even visitors to our country who want assistance... Sure because we are dependent on the tourist trade, will not get that assistance. But they want to train everybody in the railway to use apps, online devices, with no physical human presence. And we could have a dystopian railway that is de-staffed without assistance. But, but that, that is sort of... Could become but, but almost everybody in society uses apps and uses smartphones and, 
uh, automated ticketing, and, and frankly, I use it, it, it works pretty well. That's surely just going with the times, but actually if there's more staff yeah. on the platform, uh, that would be uh, fantastic. Oh, that. But, but if I tell you, Richard, that the, the companies that, uh, have put in place systems where the people working in the booking offices don't have the technology that you would have at home because they're deliberately starving our members of the ability to provide the service that they want so that they can create the, the so-called... Uh, change in demand so that they can get rid of the city office so we want to work with the companies but we want to work in an atmosphere where people don't have to lose their jobs but, but, but is it want to remain on the railway if, but, but is it, re is it really right to subcontracting and outsourcing we don't need to lose jobs in fact they're short of people at the moment on the railway but do you not accept i mean now with working from home with post-covid far fewer people using the railways particularly on certain days of the week if you've got uh, let's say 70% of the people using the railways, it's inevitable that there's going to be, have to be a reassessment of how it's funded. You know, that's just a, a harsh reality. And I just think the, the, the sort of the, the, the threats and the sort of the slightly sort of tone of what's coming out, the worst strike for 100 years, I, I think that, that grates with the public, Mick, and I think you, you, well, you lose what support media. you might have. The media have mentioned the worst strike for 100 years. It's certainly the biggest... Um, mobilisation of our members since privatisation in one go. We haven't mentioned the general strike. That's your colleagues uh, in the hyperbole department of your local tabloid. So this is a big dispute. There's no doubt about that. But it's a big issue. And it what why it's a bit such a big issue is because the Department for Transport and the Treasury are dictating the terms to the companies and they have to carry out one centralised policy in regard to a multitude of companies. So we have to respond across those companies because we're getting one piece of policy delivered across the table to us when we sit down with them. So that's why it's one piece. But I don't think it's like the general strike. This is an issue. We will take careful, planned industrial action if we cannot get a settlement but what, and what so, our claims. And what sort of response do you get from? Do you think you'll get from members of the public in terms of sympathy? My sense is, and, I, and I've asked my callers uh, today and my viewers to give us a, uh, their feelings on it, my sense is that you will lose any public sympathy if you have a big summer of discontent i mean this could be this could be your last big strike before massive changes that are that are implemented well the government is thinking that it's going to change the law again on the trade union activity and we'll have to, we've already got the most restrictive trade union laws in the western world and what they're seeking to do is take away the fundamental rights of people to, to take industrial action and to combine and we're threatened with going back to the combination act in effect now, last week i saw that the toll puddle martyrs tree is going to be dedicated, somebody's got the idea to dedicate it to freedom and to the Queen. And while we've got those acts, we've got people who are clamping down on our rights. So we, we, we've we got the right to organise and the right to represent our members effectively and assertively. But do you, do you not we, accept them? If you, if you we are ordinary people, Richard. I think completely. I get that. We're sick and tired of money being redistributed in this country from the low paid to the wealthy, which is what's happening at the moment. If you take, I think, uh, I think, I think there are many people concerned about energy companies. But they're me, making billions uh, while that's people a whole, are facing austerity. Uh, you, you, funnily enough, I agree with you on that, um, and I'm a supporter of a windfall tax. My concern is the over, you overreach yourselves. The public will view it as, as as unreasonable, and there's a much greater danger that many will say, "Well, actually, you shouldn't be allowed to strike because the railways are a critical part of our national infrastructure. We should have more automation of of driverless trains." and so on. And so you might actually end up being your, your own worst enemy if you're not careful. Well, driverless trains on the underground have been estimated by London Transport Management as costing £10 billion, which is a waste of money, frankly, because you'll still have to have it attended anyway. Nobody wants to travel on a train that, down on the Jeep tube that's got nobody on it. So that's a bit of a red herring, I think. What we need is an effective response from the TUC and from the government where workers can get a square deal in this environment. We don't want mass redundancies. We don't want people being put out of work in a recession. We want a fair deal for our people. And if the RMT or the, or the railway union groups are banned from taking effective industrial action, every worker in this country will be weaker because then we'll have more P&Os. We saw the weakness of the law in the P&O dispute where there was nothing we could do to injunct that company. If we're not allowed to take effective strike action or industrial action uh, in other industries, we will have no bargaining chips and we'll have a completely unfair and skewed society where the bosses uh, and the people that own these companies 
will have everything stacked in their favour and the workers will just have to yeah. take what they're given no matter what is given to them. Mick, I hear what you say. I think there's a real danger if you overreach yourselves, this could be your last big, great strike. You surely don't want it to be your Arthur Scargo moment. Mick Lynch, thank you so much indeed, uh, General Secretary of the RMT Union. This is a big issue. We'll be coming back to it without question. Lots of concerns there. We've just got time for a quick call before the top of the hour. We've got Pat in uh, Suffolk, I think. Hi, Pat. Hi, hi. Just to quickly, what's on your mind? Well, this um, thing about Tower Hamlets, which I thought you just heard about, um, you were saying how the, a lot of the women have been sort of basically subjugated into putting their ex where they wanted by their husbands, yes. partners, whatever. It, it's funny, we've heard no sort of um, mass uh, um, marches about all this. Um, and yet, you know, uh, when uh, somebody does something a little, little off, there's big march, all oh, the, the women are being put upon by the men, etc., etc. It, it's a bit like the S F G FGM, isn't it, where um, women are being really nastily abused and whatever it, 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 by, it's by a, a society. And yet there's no, there's no sort of women out there protesting in the streets. Well, well, unfortunately, in, in certain groups and certain uh, societies, uh, it's much, much harder for them to stand up for their rights and uh, their equalities. And, and you know, this, uh, this monitoring group have highlighted a real concern here. Yeah, what's, yeah, what, just, what's your last this, thought, Pat, this, before we go? Yeah. Well, this is why we have these women protesting on the streets. Uh, they're oppressed. They're oppressed, surely. Why aren't they doing anything? Surely this should be highlighted to them. Well, that's... Um, you're, you know. you're right, Pat. That's why I'm talking about it, because it is absolutely vital. Coming up in the, the second hour, we're going to be talking about the NHS's dependency on China for medical supplies. It's Ty's Talk, here on Talk TV. <laughs>
on radio and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Talk TV News at 11. Good morning, I'm Nadira Tudor. The Education Secretary is insisting that the Prime Minister has not intervened with the Sue Gray report. Ross Johnson remains under pressure to explain a secret meeting with a senior civil servant over her investigation into Partygate. Nadeem Zahawi says he's unaware who called the meeting or what was discussed but insisted the process has been robust. Ukraine is warning that agreeing to a ceasefire with Russia would risk them hitting back harder. The country has ruled out making a deal with Vladimir Putin with President Zelensky's advisers insisting that making any concessions would backfire. Russian forces are being told to leave Ukraine before the peace process can continue. Meanwhile, Russian forces have continued their attacks on the eastern Donbass region following their capture of Mariupol. Ministry of Defense Intelligence say that the country's only operational terminated tank is likely to have been sent to the region as part of the offensive. Joe Biden is warning that everyone should be concerned about the monkeypox outbreak. The president of the U.S. says the country is looking into vaccines and treatments. After 120 confirmed or suspected cases were reported across the globe, 20 of those cases are in Britain. Survivors of the Manchester Arena terror attack and Mayor Andy Burnham will take part in a race through the city to mark the fifth anniversary. There'll be an uh, applaud for the 22 victims ahead of the race and church bells will ring at 10.31pm. At the time, a bomb was detonated at the Ariana Grande concert back in 2017. Talk TV spoke to Paul Price, who survived the attack but tragically lost his partner Elaine. The future is still frightening for me. Um, it's still, you know, there's so many struggles for me. One of them is loneliness. I've got lots of people to do stuff with, but I've got no one to do nothing with. Australia's Labour Party leader Anthony Albanese has said he wants to unite the country and work on changing the climate policy. The centre-left politician has said that the country could become a renewable energy superpower. He'll be sworn in as PM tomorrow, but the party is still 76 seats short of a majority. My Labour team. banned from entering Russia. Back in 2017, the actor appeared in a clip in which he accused the Kremlin of attacking America's democracy during the US elections in 2016. Now time for today's weather. Trust us to take you there. Times Travel sponsors Talk TV Weather. It will be rather cloudy in the northwest with outbreaks of patchy rain, especially across western Scotland. Drier and brighter elsewhere, the best of the sunshine being across the southeast of England. Zooming in, and we can see it will be cloudy with outbreaks of rain across northern and western Scotland. Although some sunny spells are likely through the central belt, but some locally heavy showers are also possible here. Some sun with scattered showers across Northern Ireland, but cloud and patchy rain for Northern England. Some patchy rain is likely for Western Wales, but drier in the east and across the Midlands. Southern parts of England will be dry with plenty of prolonged sunny spells, especially in the southeast, where it will be warm in the sunshine, remaining cloudy with patchy rain in the northwest, drier and brighter elsewhere, with sunshine and showers. Trust us to take you there. Times Travel sponsors Talk TV Weather. The Sunday Night Club is your club. I'll take you inside the dressing room, from the terraces to the boardroom, to ask the questions you want answered. There is no membership required for the Sunday Night Club from 7. Welcome back, everyone, to Ty's Talk. We have just cruised into the second hour of this morning's show. And what did you think to that discussion, chat, interview with the General Secretary? One uh, tweet that's come in here, Steve in London says... 
Uh, why do they need to strike over a bullying manager when there are grievance and disciplinary procedures which the unions backed? Uh, sick to death, Steve says, of being held to ransom by unions. I think many people uh, feel that way, but actually the caller earlier, Christine, she had a different view. What are your thoughts? Give us a call, 0344 499 1000. This could become one of the big, big issues over the coming summer. There could be other uh, unions that are uh, looking to strike as well, obviously with inflation. So, you know, we're going to have to get used to this. And I think that we've got to stand up very clearly as uh, as the general public and say enough's enough. We don't want strikes on our transport, our railway systems. And if you're going to go on strike, folks, then actually, yeah, this could be your sort of Arthur Scargill moment. It could be the moment where we say, well, let's invest more. actually far from learning the lessons of covid that we should be less reliant on overseas nations in particular china uh, in regard to vital medical supplies guess what we've done exactly the opposite i'm delighted to be joined by robert clark who's the director of the defense uh, let's try that again he's the director of defense and security at civitas robert a very good morning thanks uh, for being on vital medical supplies and that actually that number has it's trebled uh from pre-pandemic levels when actually we should be doing the opposite uh, good morning richard thank you for having me um no absolutely what you've just said is completely accurate um the pre-pandemic levels uh of the the reliance on the nhs supply chains for uh what's under the government's critical uh, and disaster relief list uh has has in fact trebled we've gone from around six percent uh, to just under 18% um, of the product. So these include, for example, around 80% of all NHS bandages, over 50% of uh, gloves, uh, and around 80% uh, of masks. Um, and it gets even more disturbing when we consider things like reliance on oxygen, wheelchairs, uh, needles, and syringes. These are all, as you can imagine, critical components uh, within the NHS supply chains. Um, I think the important thing to remember is really that in the hubris of the the first pandemic and the well the, the first lockdown in the pandemic it was understandable if not condonable to source these products from from china which are readily available but this is two years on now um and the government have in fact like you mentioned it, it it's just gone uh, far worse now so it's really come to the point where how has this been allowed to continue and what can we do now to change this and there were real concerns about the way that some of those early contracts during with that but equally there was some massive massive profiteering there were questions about sort of vip contracts do you think that uh, there is now back to a proper tendering process or do you think that some of those uh, companies that got some of those big early contracts they've sort of remained in place almost by default and are continuing to make vast profits at our expense no that, that's exactly what's happened um, what, hopefully one of the key things that we can learn from this now is the fact that we need to almost reinvest back into British. You know, why are the civil service hamstringing British business and British manufacturing um, for the more uh, cheaply available, uh, in effect, slave labour products manufactured from China? We have to remember, this is a regime that isn't beholden to uh, British or, or uh, liberal democratic values and standards. Um, you know, this is a Person over the last two years 
is uh, incredibly unreliable of the uh, uh, irresponsible sorry of the government and really needs to come to a point now where we need to start asking why why is this happening this comes in the wake as well it's been two years to the month now of uh, project defend which was the government's own uh, whitehall instigated review of the critical supply chain reliance um so really we need some answers from the government as to why this has been allowed to continue Twenty-four percent of all medical consumables, uh, and you know, it just feels to me, uh, in a sense, China has the potential to weaponize this dependency uh, in a in a really, really difficult and dangerous way. And uh, as, you know, a, I want to buy British, uh, but b, I just don't want to be exposed to a rogue regime, uh, an autocratic regime that you know you've highlighted some of the real concerns that we all have. And, uh, you know, they can deliberately uh, reduce the supplies, the price goes up, uh, and you've got profiteering from the, uh, the brokers for these contracts. And the problem... something Italy two years ago um, to supply PPE in return for favourable uh, diplomatic concessions uh, for issues exposed to I think it was um, paracetamol almost all of which was being made in India and ag again you know we just shouldn't be that exposed just in time supply chains around the world's all well and good when the sun shines uh, like today uh, but you know when trouble emerges we we we're really exposed we're really vulnerable no absolutely I mean the project defend review wasn't um, sort of targeted directly against China it was against all uh, countries in which British supplies were, uh, they had a majority from, from one country, so over 50%, like you mentioned, the paracetamol, which is around 90, 95% from India. Um, so the, the fact that this isn't just friendly countries as well, but I have to highlight that the extreme risks of uh, having such reliance on a country like China, I think, I like to think the time has come uh, in this almost post-pandemic age where the general public are more aware of the the threat perception um, by by China. You know, we can only see how um, you know they've handled you know uh, covering up the origins of the the COVID pandemic, for example, um, almost blackmailing and, and holding ransom the WHO in the early days, um, and they've really sort of stymied the collective international global response to the recovery. And I think the so right. it's not just yeah, it, it friendly is. nations. It, it's, it's to highlight just how incredibly dangerous this is with with China in particular. I'm very sceptical. I'm also sceptical, for example, of the influence that China has on the World Health Organization. This is the organization that at the beginning of the pandemic said that we shouldn't be wearing masks. And then all of a sudden, a few months later, they said we should be wearing masks. And where are all the masks made? China. There we no, go. I mean, the, the relationship between China and the WHO was pretty shocking, to be honest. Um, one particularly uh, disturbing instance is how uh, China blocked... Taiwan uh, in the early days from having a voice on the WHO Council. This was before the lockdown and Taiwan, as we all know, have had a, a remarkably successful um, sort of uh, process of dealing with the pandemic and China basically blocked any efforts to allow Taiwan a voice. Um, exactly, so it's, Robert. it's incredibly destabilizing the, the effect China have internationally, not just with our supply chains, but more broadly. Completely. Robert, thank you so much for those thoughts, concerns about being over-dependent, being vulnerable to Chinese medical supplies for our NHS. That was Robert Clark, the Director of Defence and Security. Uh, we're going to head up to Newcastle, where I think I've got John on the line. Morning, John. Good morning, Richard. Basically, um, I believe in this country, after decades... <laughs> 
that we should have reform in this country. I don't believe the Tory, Labour and Liberal parties uh, are not good enough for the people of this country. However, we call ourselves the mother of democracies, but I've never understood, Jenny Kampampa, how 800 plus in the undemocratic House of Lords are there, and yet we only have 650 MPs. Oh, it's... That's that's a point of view. The second one is healthcare. Fifty years ago, I went to France on holiday, uh, twice a month for three weeks, and I realised there, speaking to some people, that they waited three weeks for, for an operation in general. And I thought, wow, our people in this country were waiting, depending on the health authority, six weeks, nine weeks, twelve weeks, fifteen weeks plus. And I thought that was pretty disgusting. Uh, but fast forward the clock, forty-eight years before before coronavirus, what do I have? The French now wait four weeks in general before for an operation. But our people were still waiting six weeks, nine weeks, 12 weeks, 15 weeks for an operation. So our health service is not fit for purpose, no matter what we individually think. Um, I was okay. You know, I'm all right, Jack. She's all right, Jill. Yes. But we're talking about 65 million people, possibly. You're so and, right. It, it uh, is, there, you know, there, there are increasing concerns. The waiting lists are going up and up, and it's becoming yeah. ever less fit for purpose. And actually, the yes. truth is, I, we didn't protect the NHS, and the NHS isn't looking after no. its customers, us, the people. And when two years... I'm a Brexiteer, Nigel Farage uh, supporter, uh, something like yourself, I believe, uh, in that sense. Uh, absolutely, report. absolutely, and, John. Um, and TV licence. When I was across there, I'm a Brexiteer, and they said, well, why do you not like France anymore? Do you not like... I said, I love Europe. I said, I don't love the European Union. That's well, a big difference. That, after that's the difference, years. isn't it, John? John, thank you so much. We're absolutely in full agreement on that. We love Europe. We love the people of Europe. We just don't like the bureaucratic monster that the European Union has become. Now, uh, we have had a few sound issues in the second hour. I'm really sorry about that. Hopefully the engineers have sorted it, are sorting it, will sort it. Uh, but let us know if you still have any sound issues. We should be on top of that because I want you to hear everything, the guests, what we're saying, and hear your views here at the home of Common Sense. It is, of course, Ty's Talk. Give us a call, give us a ring, stay with us. It's Talk TV.
Welcome back to Ty's Talk. We are here in the second hour of this glorious sunny Sunday morning. I hope it's sunny with you. We've had a few sound issues. Hopefully those are resolved and you'll continue to be able to listen uninterrupted. Certainly uh, Twitter is still working, that is for sure. Loads of messages coming in here. Regarding Tower Hamlets, a few uh, go messages, thoughts here. Uh, one from RC who says, as for Tower Hamlets, the voting irregularities, uh, you know, is this... Uh, from a, a majority population where countries uh, where this sort of voting uh, activity and behaviour is the norm, uh, beyond repair, he suspects. I don't think it is acceptable to say it's beyond repair. We should have the greatest, most efficient, uh, most trusted... Personation and the Electoral Commission need to get on top of it. Uh, meanwhile, regarding the discussion on the unions, Angela says, I don't agree with strikes, but without unions, we'll have a downtrodden society. Before unions, we had slave labour. Do you want that, Richard? No, of course not, Angela. I wasn't suggesting that. Unions have an important role to play, but they, you know, they've, got to be, uh, they've got to be reasonable about it, as opposed to bullying and threatening. And I think there are better ways of resolving issues regarding pay and conditions. And I think it's completely unreasonable to suggest that, you know, there could be, you'd guarantee forever there'd be no, uh, no changes to working practices or redundancies because, you know, that's what technology does. Technology evolves, it changes. And yet we've had that for, for centuries and yet we've still got effectively, incredibly, full employment and wages are going up. So I think unions have an important role to play, but I think they should play it carefully. And if they overplay their hand, which Arthur Scargill did with the miners in the early 1980s, the result was the mining industry was devastated and pretty much destroyed here in the UK. And my observation to Mick Lynch and to the RMT is if they overplay their hand with this summer of, of potential discontent and huge rail strikes, then I think more and more of the public will say, actually, ban strikes in critical national infrastructure and invest in more automated driverless trains like on the DLR. There we are. Anyway, uh, let's, have, uh, let's go up to Leeds, where Anthony is patiently waiting. Morning, Anthony. Yes, good morning, Richard. How morning. are you doing? What's on your mind? Not bad. My, my mind is diesel crossing the English Channel. Now... Why can't we send them back to France? Uh, well, it's a very good question, and the simple answer is that whilst many of us uh, think that is the, the, the smartest thing to do to stop the, the you know the vile trade, uh, the French uh, the French have resisted that. Well, and no, why can't? Well, if I'm a prime minister, I'll stand up to that Macron, that little pink squeak in France. I'll send them back to France. Why don't he, Why don't Johnson have the backbone to send them back? Well, uh, the, the, we know all about the Prime Minister, don't we? And uh, the fact is, they haven't had the backbone. I agree with you. I think that... Uh, because the, the French, all these middle-class the, middle people swung off to France having that red wine. I'll which is, which is delicious, and, and, and I love a bit of red wine. Look, France is a safe country. Uh, and actually, the, oh, best yeah. way, the best way for France to reduce the number of these illegal migrants coming into France is so that people know that actually they can't make it through France to the United Kingdom. So actually what the French should be doing is, is a joint approach with ourselves. Uh, and the moment you come into France or if you try and come uh, on the English Channel, you're going to be picked up, you're going to be taken away. Uh, and if, if you're taken to Rwanda, for example, I mean, it would stop in a week if those flights uh, took place the very well, same day someone landed. Yeah, after sending the, you just turn back to France. Well, yes, you, what, what, what you'd have to do... If not, them fishermen fishing our water, some fans, I'll give them a day. I say, get your French boats out now. I say, swing your hook. No, we did we'll go off. Yeah, well, like, at, at the moment, you see, they're allowed like to France under the licences. country, like Americans interfering in Northern Ireland, that's a nation of hot dogs and donuts, is that America? I'll tell them to bugger off as well. There we are, Anthony. Thank you for that. Uh, Anthony's pretty clear. If he was Prime Minister, he'd be taking the illegal migrants straight back to France. Uh, we're going to head back from Leeds to uh, Dulwich, where I think I've got Anne on the line. 
You have Richard. Hi there. Is it Anne or Anna? It's Anne. Hi there. What's uh, what's on your mind, Anne? Uh, Richard, I always 100% believe in everything you say and I follow you rigidly and I think you just got the the beating heart of the nation. Uh, oh, bless you. That's a good day. Thank you. I just want to put you up on one little thing. Oh, no, please do. Uh, none, of, uh, none of us are perfect, that is for sure, least uh, of all me. I, I'm registered blind. I am in a wheelchair. I rely on friends to take me or my, my uh, family to take me around. I haven't got a smile tap. You said everybody's got a smile taps. I tell you what, uh, there's a hell of a lot of people in this country that haven't got smile taps. If you automate the whole of the railway system... You leave us with nowhere to go. I need people to get me on and off the train with ramps uh, in my wheelchair. I need people to guide me through the ticket office to buy tickets. None of my friends have got apps. They're quite willing to walk there and, and hand me over to the, the, the staff and, and they get me off the other end. But without, if, if we've got to rely on apps to get on our, our tickets... There's a hell of a lot of us that can be left behind by... No, and and um, thank you so much for uh, highlighting that and raising it. And I wasn't saying that there shouldn't be any staff anywhere, and absolutely not, to be clear. Uh, wh what I meant to say was that um, more and more people are using apps, but, of course, there are, there, there are plenty of people, as you quite rightly highlighted, that are not. What I would rather is that there would be, in a sense, the staff that are in the, in the ticket office, if they had, for example, a... Uh, a tablet, uh, and they were on the platform, then then they could be uh, acting as more sort of customer-facing, helpful staff to help uh, exactly as you've just suggested. Uh, people who, um, uh, you know, need help uh, getting onto the platform, getting onto the trains. Uh, of course, th that's always essential. Uh, but what, what my concern was that the unions don't want to accept any change at all. That was the point I was trying to make, Anne. Yeah, I, I thoroughly agree with you that. I mean, the RMT are notorious for it, aren't they? Uh, they hold the key with everything, apparently. They they are, and I just think that, um, you know, I, I love the trains. I use them as much as I can. But, uh, you know, they have got to move with the times, and, you know, it's right to invest. And in a sense, if that means that we can have more uh, customer-facing, helpful, smiley staff looking after uh, people coming onto the trains and onto the system, then so much the better. Yeah, I think it'll be a great boom for the tourists as well. Yeah, absolutely. If they and all need help. No, that's uh, that's fantastic. And um, thank you so much, Anne, for thank your you. thoughts there. That's uh, Anne quite rightly saying that not everybody has uh, apps on their smartphones, and and that wasn't what I was trying to suggest. Um, but certainly there are more and more, and I think that the uh, all of the railways uh, and the tube they need to adapt to that. Actually, in a sense. The tube very much is, uh, with contactless payments and things. Um, but actually, if you had more customer-facing staff on the platform, smiling, helping, uh, and, and also selling tickets at the same time, maybe that's a sort of a win-win. That's the sort of positivity I'd like to see from uh, the trade unions, as opposed to threats that uh, they're going to just go on strike with the biggest strike uh, for a century. Meanwhile, a tweet here, not bothered about the forthcoming railway strike and I don't use it because the booking system is so confusing, the prices are extortionate, the staff are so unfriendly and the rolling stock is so filthy and uncomfortable and the timetable is sparse and so unreliable. I think that's from NC. It's fair to say he is not a big fan of the railways. But it could be so much better. Maybe it could look, run like the Swiss railways that literally run like clockwork. You don't need a watch in Switzerland when you use the trains because they come absolutely bang on time. There we are. Stay with us. You're listening to Ty's Talk here on Talk TV. If my friends had to describe me, I don't know, maybe you should ask them, but I think, or I hope they would say, I am the life and the soul of the party. I'll arrive, things get going, things get done. I'm a doer. They'd say that. They'd also say I'm glass <laughs> half full. <laughs> <laughs> I look for the positive things in people's lives, in what's going on. But also, I think they'd say I'm passionate. I'm passionate about what I do, what I support, what I believe in. This is Talk TV News. 
Good morning, I'm Nadira Tudor. The Education Secretary is insisting that the Prime Minister has not intervened with the Sue Gray report. Ross Johnson remains under pressure to explain a secret meeting with the senior civil servant over her investigation into Partygate. Nadim Zahami says he's unaware who called the meeting or what was discussed, but insisted the process has been robust. Ukraine is warning that agreeing to a ceasefire with Russia would risk them hitting back harder. The country has ruled out making a deal with Vladimir Putin, with President Zelensky's advisers insisting that making any concessions would backfire. Russian forces are being told to leave Ukraine before the peace process can continue. Joe Biden is warning that everyone should be concerned about the monkeypox outbreak. The president of the U.S. says the country is looking into vaccines and treatments after 120 confirmed or suspected cases were reported across the globe. Survivors of the Manchester Arena terror attack and Mayor Andy Burnham will take part in a race through the city to mark the fifth anniversary. There'll be an applaud for the 22 victims ahead of the race and church bells will ring at 10.31pm. The time a bomb was detonated at the Ariana Grande concert back in 2017. Talk TV spoke to Paul Price who survived the attack but tragically lost his partner Elaine. The future is still frightening for me. Um... It's still, you know, there's so many struggles for me. One of them is loneliness. I've got lots of people to do stuff with, but I've got no one to do nothing with. And Morgan Freeman is among almost 1,000 Americans who've been permanently banned from entering Russia. Back in 2017, the actor appeared in a clip in which he accused the Kremlin of attacking America's democracy during the US elections in 2016. That's all for now. We'll have more in half an hour. Welcome back to Ty's Talk here on Talk TV. We are cruising through the second hour of my three-hour show and uh, all sorts of messages coming in about what we've been talking about, about the waste of taxpayers' cash, uh, about the, uh, the, the rail unions. This is going to be a big topic throughout the whole of the summer, no question, my interview with Mick Lynch. Look, I want the railways to be better and better. My concern is that the RMT that they're sort of stuck in aspic and they think that it can stay the same forever. It can't. It's got to adapt. It's got to adjust. It's got to look forwards. And those working on it, likewise. Um, shortly, we're going to be talking about the last day of the Premier League, the football season. It's an incredibly exciting day because all of the games uh, in the Premier League are taking place 4 o'clock this afternoon and the title race is up for grabs between Manchester City and Liverpool. Uh, there is just one point between them. Uh, they've both got games at home. City are playing. Uh, City are playing Aston Villa, which is managed, of course, by the former Liverpool captain Steven Gerrard. And Liverpool are at home to Wolves. Um, and then at the bottom of the table, also, there's crucial, crucial relegation battles going on between Brentford. Uh, sorry, between Leeds, who are away to Brentford, and Burnley who are at home to Newcastle. Lots of excitement. I'm hoping we're going to be talking to the TalkSport reporter, Mickey Gray, who is uh, live at the Etihad Stadium, uh, awaiting that 4pm kickoff. Mickey, are you with me this morning? Yes, I'm with you. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Great to have you on the show. What a day. I mean, this really is for, you know, for, for so many people, so many games uh, which are crucial to the outcome at the top and bottom of the league. Um, how do you think people at the City are feeling? Uh, clearly, uh, Steven Gerrard sadly failed to win a Premier League championship for Liverpool when he was there, but he could certainly help Liverpool today if his team, Aston Villa, holds City firm. Yeah, I think a lot of people have been he's not able to uh, participate in the game, and I think Aston Villa would love him to be in the start 11, but unfortunately that's not going to happen. And um, I think everybody's kind of looking to see who might slip up. Will it be Liverpool or will it be Manchester City? Well, they've been there and they've stood the test of time so many times now, Manchester City, and I just can't see them failing against Aston Villa. It's going to be an incredible atmosphere at the stadium. I'm looking forward to getting down there a little bit later on this afternoon. Um, and the players are ready for it. They're up for it. And um, it, it's just going to be a fantastic occasion. Look, I see Manchester City winning the game. I think it might be a difficult one, but I also see Liverpool winning too. And the two sides themselves, I mean, the streets ahead of everybody else in the Premier League. 
they've been a joy to watch over the last four or five seasons. You're so right. I mean, they really are streets ahead. But actually, in the last few games, if anything, City have been slightly the stronger, I would say. Uh, mm. You know, Liverpool slipped up against Tottenham. Um, and Liverpool, you know, in theory, still on for the quadruple. But today, if City win, then then that's the end of that. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. It's it's 90 minutes and that's it. I mean, um, you look at some of the performances of late from, from Manchester City and Liverpool. I mean, everybody thought that um, the 2-2 the two -two draw for, for Man City against West Ham was a, a bit of a... A bit of a banana skin, let's say, but um, I, I just think in front of their home fans, they've got the chance to win the Premier League title under Pep Guardiola. I, I just think it's a brilliant occasion. And, and Liverpool have done so much. I mean, they had such a big gap to claw themselves back to, to, to get themselves into this position, um, fighting for the Premier League title against Manchester City. But um, absolutely, I and think then, it's just one step too far. Yeah, that's right, Mickey. And then at the other end of the table, so um, incredibly tense as well, uh, Leeds and Burnley with their two games. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I've seen quite a lot of Burnley and I've seen quite a lot of Leeds United this season. Two, two sides with obviously two new managers who've been basically brought into the football club to, to keep them in the Premier League. And again, it comes down to this final game, and it's it, it's so difficult. Um, I mean, one of them's my old club, Leeds United, and um, you know, you talk about home form and support. There's nobody better. They're absolutely incredible. But um, what a story Burnley have been. You know, the minnows. I think you probably look at them that way. But um, it, again, I can't call it. It's so hard. Oh come on! I mean, I'm going I'm, I'm to force everything. you to call it. Come on, Mickey. <laughs> You've got to call it for me and my uh, listeners. Well. Well, just because I said it's my old club, Leeds United, um, I, I just think momentum, um, final day against Brentford, I think they're going to do it. And I don't think Burnley have got e enough to actually get um, the there, points that they need on the board. In the there we game. are. Mickey, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for your thoughts there. Uh, that's Mickey Gray from TalkSport. He's going to be at the Etihad Stadium this afternoon watching that Manchester City game. He thinks that his old club, Leeds, will just about... Uh, survive and stay up and that Burnley would go down. That would mean Alistair Campbell would be very grumpy this evening. Uh, there we are. Um, thanks, Mickey, for that. Now, we're going to head down from Manchester to Southampton, where I think Gordon is there on the end of the line. Morning, Gordon. Yeah, good morning, Richard. Uh, great show as always. Always listen to what well, Thanks a lot. Saturday. A Sunday, I should say. Um, just about the, the things you were saying this morning, the three main parties are just um, absolutely abysmal. They, they were out of touch. Um, they're just... They, they're not worthy of my vote, quite frankly. And, and, you know, I'm hearing this from so many people who are so frustrated. And uh, it, the tragedy, of course, is when, Gordon, when people say they're not going to bother to vote... It's a wasted vote. That that's my my error. And, and if you put a candidate in my area, I will be voting. I'm very tempted to become a supporter of your uh, party, um, but just the cost of living crisis. Um, they are just they don't get it. They're all multimillionaires. They don't get it. Uh, they really don't. And what frustrates me is actually, yes, some of the. Uh, the cost inflation is due to factors beyond their control. But some of it was completely in their control, the energy pricing, the crisis. And there are things they can do, Gordon. You know, they actually have got uh, much more robust finances. They can afford to cut taxes in the short term yeah. uh, so that, you know, they can uh, ease the cost of living crisis and that will create yeah. higher growth. And in the medium term, will therefore get higher tax revenues. They should be doing that and they should be using shale gas. Are you with me on that, Gordon? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's like they, they should be promoting, as we've just said about the stuff from China, they should be promoting British companies to be supplying British people. You're so and, right. And really pushing on that, but they're not, and they're... I'm sorry, they're an absolute shower. They're out of touch, of, Gordon. Both sides of the house. I agree with you. We certainly plan to stand 600-plus candidates at the general election. Thank you, yeah. Gordon, for your thoughts, your views. We're going to head from Southampton to Plymouth where Mike is on the end of the line. Morning, Mike. Hello there. How are you doing? What's on your mind this morning? Are you happy you with like? everything that's going on, or have you got some concerns? Oh, well, far from happy with a lot that's not going on. But what I mainly want to speak about is the railway strike. Now, I've worked on the railway for over 50 years now, 
We've just um, got a minute, Mike, I, so make it uh, make it prompt. Right. Well, to say there's been no change, there must be in an aspect, is wrong. I used okay. to be a driver. And when I started on the railway, all trains were driver, second man and a guard. Yep. Now, most long-distance passenger trains, they'll do have a guard because you do need people to talk to passengers and they need help. Most short-distance ones, commuter trains, are single-manned. All freight trains are single-manned. So there's been a great deal of change there. With regard to ticket offices, uh, it's already well having ticket machines, but not everyone is uh, with apps and know how to use it. That's right, as, as Anne quite rightly said yesterday, honest. earlier. Yeah, and obviously older people, and particularly females, don't want to be on a station where there are no staff. Now, the uh, ticket people are sat there behind the screen where they've got access to their computers, they can look up all the different types of trains. It's not practical to have them wandering around the platform with a laptop to the queue of 20 but, people behind them. But, but Mike, so are, are the... Are, changes in, in the 50 years I've been on the railway. No, and that's good. My concern is that they, they want no change in working practices. That's what's been alluded to, whether that's just a negotiating point. Is that well, really the case? One of the changes is on the PW side is they want to do able lookouts under certain circumstances where you have three men working on the track and then there's a lookout either side of them who sounds a horn or if they're using electrical equipment presses a button that shuts it off and a train approaches. Can you imagine the dangers of people working there without a lookout? Hundred, over 100 years ago, you see accidents where five PW men killed, hit by a train. And the company directors would munificently award no, 50 pounds I mean to the widow and six kids. Sure. You want to go back to those days? No, of the course, Swiss absolutely. Run on time, because but they're not, the main railway is not privatised. Run with the state, and of course, it's powered by hydroelectric electricity, which is a lot. Indeed. Cheaper. Well, it, essentially, Mike. I mean, as long as they're willing to adapt to modern, uh, you know, modern pr practices, modern technology, the concern is yeah. that they're sort of saying they want no change at all. Mike, I've got to go uh, to yeah. the break, but thank you very much for those thoughts. That was Mike in Plymouth. Just saying, actually, there have been changes. My point is fine, but I want them to continue to change, continue to modernise, and to con continue, of course, to be safe, but also to look after customers on the platforms themselves. Stay with us. You're listening to Ties Talk here at the home of Common Sense Talk TV.
Welcome back to Tice Talk. We are approaching the end of the second hour. I hope they've sorted out the sound issues. Let us know if that is still an ongoing uh, problem for you. Uh, lots of thoughts there. Fascinating discussion of, and great calls. Keep them coming. 0344 499 1000. At the top of the hour, at 12 o'clock, we have got an exclusive first. We've got Lee and Olga Winter, two of the world's uh, finest uh, instructors on skydiving, tandem skydiving, and they took uh, four severely injured combat veterans uh, who'd been injured uh, in uh, in combat zones in Afghanistan for the British Army, uh, and they took them to Mount Everest, and they went up in a helicopter, and from about 25,000 feet, uh, they took them skydiving. Quite remarkable. They're here in the studio to talk about this. Uh, incredible, incredible uh, activity. Meanwhile, uh, before then, uh, we've got to talk about uh, the impact of the war in Ukraine on uh, food supplies, shortages and price increases because there's no question that the, uh, the knock-on consequences from this horrific war are reverberating around the world. And uh, there's obviously we've seen price rises in lots of foodstuffs uh, Ukraine is the fourth biggest exporter, I believe, in the world of wheat. And real concerns, is it going to lead to some form of shortage, particularly where they export to in Africa? I'm delighted to be joined now by Arnaud Petit, the Executive Director of the International Grains Council. Arnaud, good morning to you. Thanks for joining us on uh, Talk TV. So, uh, you know, this horrific war uh, is sort of in, in a sort of stage of, of grinding ongoing uh, attrition and Ukraine is a huge exporter of grain and indeed sunflower oil. Um, how concerned should we be? Uh, the ports have been blockaded, um, disrupted, uh, damaged. Um, is there any exporting of, uh, of grain going on from Ukraine at the moment or, or is it essentially sort of stopped? Good morning and thank you for having me in your program. I would say in terms of quantity of volume available around the globe, there is no uh, shortage. Uh, we have more than one year and a half on storage for trade. So there is not a matter of concern for that. But when you are losing, as you are mentioning that, referring to that, losing the cheapest bread basket, definitively your price on the global market are going up. And if you add also the crisis on the energy market, so all the transportation cost is also going up. That, I would say, the two big drivers of the very high prices we are facing at the moment on the grains market. So that's good news that you don't see, a, in a sense, uh, a shortage uh, in terms of the, the global stock of it. I guess the next question is, um, can that be moved to the areas that would previously be buying grain from Ukraine? Uh, if that supply has been has been cut off? I would say it's clear that to get back to the previous situation, we should have the deep sea port working in Ukraine. And it's not in a short term period of time, we don't see that resuming. Therefore, there, several countries will need to look about alternatives. And alternatives exist in India, in Australia, in Europe soon. Uh, and then in North America, we expect that Canada is doing a very good rebound in productions. So there will be available supplies in terms of alternatives. But again, the cost of that grains will be higher. And there, there is a matter for poor people in, in several countries. Indeed, because obviously you've got the higher transport cost. And, and I guess some of the uh, higher pricing, I was talking about it just the other day, I don't know, is, is that, you know, the... the the traders on the world markets, they're sort of, in a sense, speculating uh, and fear, of course, drives prices ever higher, doesn't it, on the on the markets? To get to the speculation, somewhere within the value chain, you should have an actor stopping the grains moving along the value chain, which is not the case. We see the grains continue to move uh, smoothly. The question is more for developed countries. So the cost of what you are eat eating, I would say, is linked to the cost of labour, when in developing countries, definitely, when a, a, a family spends 50% of its uh, expenditure on food, that's a big problem. 
there. So this is why we see in developing countries less margin of maneuver to cope with these high prices. But we have not seen uh, speculation from operators uh, along the grain value chain. Indeed. And in terms of uh, this year's harvest in Ukraine, uh, how badly disrupted do you think that will be? And then what about actually, in a sense, preparing for next year's harvest? Uh, when's the bulk of the harvest planted? What's the, the risks to that? So we, in a very bad situation we are at the moment, we have been lucky that Ukraine seed usually the wheat in winter period, so before the wear. So that means for this time, we would have still a relatively good harvest, but we, the, our figures is more minus 50% of production. So I would say it's a, it's a dramatic fall for, the, for Ukra Ukrainian farmers. Uh, but as you rightly mentioned, if we are not able, and I would say if the uh, grain sector is not able to get out that grain from Ukraine uh, smoothly, farmers in Ukraine may limit the gains of production in the next harvest, so harvest 23, and then we could be in an even worse situation. So it's very important today to focus about how we can move out the grains by sea, by train, by truck, is it the most important to show to the Ukrainian farmers that what they can produce will reach the global market. Indeed, I think I understand that much of the sort of the, the, the best uh, areas for, for growing wheat in Ukraine is actually in the Russian-held southeastern areas. So that presumably it's... also uh, has an impact. I, I mean, and is it a matter of storage in Ukraine or the fact that Ukrainian farmers are not being paid for what they've, uh, what they've currently grown? There, what we assessed before the, the war um, uh, uh, explode in Ukraine, um, that we stay six million tons of wheat upon the 24, 25 million tons usually Ukraine exported. So it was it was a relative amount of stocks in or volume, sorry, in comparison to what Ukraine usually do. But now what we assess more or less 10 percent of stocks, or uh, sorry, 15 percent of the capacity of stocks have been lost by the by uh, damages in the world. So that means the farmers have less and less opportunity or capacity to stock the grains or harvest, which will come from July to uh, to October. And therefore, the logistic is very important because if they cannot store, so it will yes. be lost. And if it's lost, as you said, farmers will not be paid. Indeed. So that's really something very important is to be able to ship all these grains outside Ukraine. Well, there needs to be a huge effort to uh, to organise those logistics. Arno, thank you so much for uh, those thoughts there. Uh, that was Arnaud Petit from the International Grains Council. The good news is, on a worldwide basis, there is actually plenty of grain, but clearly there are significant issues with the storage and transport and the exporting of grain from Ukraine. Uh, which could affect, well, it is affecting the price and uh, the availability of grain in Africa. Uh, thanks for that, Arno. Uh, meanwhile, we're going to head back up to York, where Mike is there. Hi there, Mike. Good morning. Just good morning. Good morning, uh, Richard. It's just about good morning, yes. And a, <laughs> and a lovely morning. What's, uh, what's on your mind? Uh, well, I was listening to uh, earlier in your programme, and you always refer to the government... You always say, well, the government's decided this and the government's decided that. But it's not um, an untangible organisation. The government are actually people, a bit like Yes Ministry in many respects. Uh, so what I'm going to say to you now is that when a Prime Minister is voted out of office, the parliamentary secretaries that are in the, the major or the main uh, departments... Um, also go with him and you have a new, fresh, young blood, different thinking, because obviously their thinking advising the government has got them voted out, so they shouldn't be in there. And I'll, if, may I give you an example? Go for it. OK. For instance, Matthew Rycroft has been re employed into the Home Office. He, yeah, he's, a, he's one of the, uh, the most senior civil servants. Yeah, he's the same guy that advised Tony Blair to go to war in Iraq. Yes. Why uh, do we have the same failures? Well, uh, and, and that, no, you're quite right there. My, my concern is that actually ministers should be able to bring in great people from the private sector to help advise them rather than constantly have uh, died-in-the-wool senior civil servants who may or may not be 
be um, willing to carry out the uh, the wishes of the elected ministers. Correct. But the other thing, and this is your neck of the wood rather than mine, did they ever, after spending £28 million, ever build the uh, Rygate to Ostend ferry? Uh, that's a new one on me. I don't know is the sample answer, but it sounds like not. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was uh, that was one of Chris Grayling's failures. Oh yes, but it wasn't. It wasn't only Chris Grayling. There would have been a department that spent twenty eight million completely wasted. Uh, absolutely right, Mike. And there needs to be some accountability. Um, but there's none. And, and, and that's my concern. That should be accountability and performance. I don't mind paying for performance as long as people actually perform and produce. And then, that, you know, in the private sector, that's how you earn bonuses, if you actually deliver. Yeah, yeah, but you don't here, do they? That's the I mean, issue. Instance, Mike, thank you very much. We've got to go to the break, to the top of the hour, but thank you very much, Mike, in York. Stay with us. We've got some lots and lots to talk about in the final hour. It's Ty's Talk. It's Talk TV. is Talk TV. Talk TV News at 12. Good morning, I'm Nadira Tudor. The Education Secretary is insisting that the Prime Minister has not intervened with the Sue Gray report. Boris Johnson remains under pressure to explain a secret meeting with a senior civil servant over her investigation into Partygate. Nadeem Zahawi says he's unaware who called the meeting or what was discussed, but insisted the process had been robust. 
Joe Biden is warning that everyone should be concerned about the monkeypox outbreak. The president of the U.S. says the country is looking into vaccines and treatments after 120 confirmed or suspected cases were reported across the globe. Russian forces have continued their attacks on the eastern Donbass region of Ukraine following their capture of Mariupol. Ministry of Defense Intelligence say that the country's only operational Terminator tank is likely to have been sent to the region as part of the offensive. Survivors of the Manchester Arena terror attack and Mayor Andy Burnham will take part in a race through the city to mark the fifth anniversary. There'll be an applaud for the 22 victims ahead of the race and church bells will ring at 10.31pm, the time a bomb was detonated at the Ariana Grande concert back in 2017. Talk TV spoke to Paul Price, who survived the attack but tragically lost his partner, Elaine. The future is still frightening for me. Um, it's still, you know, there's so many struggles for me. One of them is loneliness. I've got lots of people to do stuff with, but I've got no one to do nothing with. Over £70,000 has been raised in just two days for a boy who had his finger amputated after fleeing racist bullies. According to his mother, 11-year-old Rahim Bailey was kicked to the floor and beaten by a group of children on Tuesday. Police have launched an investigation. And Australia's Labour Party leader, Anthony Albanese, has said he wants to unite the country and work on changing the climate policy. The centre-left politician has said that the country could become a renewable energy superpower. He'll be sworn in as PM tomorrow but the party is still at 76 seats short of a majority. My Labor team will work every day to bring Australians together and I will lead a government worthy of the people of Australia. Those are the latest news headlines still to come. Your talk sport update, but first, your weather. Times Travel sponsors Talk TV Weather. It'll be rather cloudy in the northwest with outbreaks of patchy rain, especially across western Scotland. Drier and brighter elsewhere, the best of the sunshine being across the southeast of England. Zooming in, and we can see it will be cloudy with outbreaks of rain across northern and western Scotland. Some sunny spells are likely through the central belt, but locally heavy showers are also possible here. Sunny spells and scattered showers across northern Ireland, a little cloudier over northern England, but still sunny spells and showers here. Some showery rain is likely for mid Wales and the Midlands for a time but there will be also warm sunny spells developing through the afternoon. Southern parts of England will be dry with plenty of prolonged sunny spells especially in the southeast where it will be warm in the sunshine. Trust us to take you there. Times Travel sponsors Talk TV Weather. on the Premier League today as Liverpool and Man City battle it out for the trophy on the last day of the season. Jurgen Klopp's side are currently one point behind, so they're banking on a win against Wolves to reach the top spot. Manchester City are facing Aston Villa. Just Alex Ferguson with this United was able to do during three or four times, four in five years. You realise the, the, the magnitude of this United in this period when he is able to do it many, many times. So, and we are close to, to do it or be part of there. Elsewhere on the table, Arsenal are relying on Spurs to lose against Norwich if they want a spot in the Champions League. Unai Emery's side are two points behind Tottenham, who are currently fourth place in the league. Arsenal are taking on Everton this afternoon and need to secure a win if they want to take their North London rivals and secure a place in the top four. And Burnley and Leeds are fighting it out in the relegation zone. They're both on 37 points, so it could go either way. Talk Sports' extensive coverage of the final day of the Premier League season it kicks off from 2 o'clock. And La Liga says it's reporting PSG to UEFA over the 300 million euro contract handed to Kylian Mbappe. They're suggesting that the club can't be adhering to financial fair play because the three-year deal gives the players some control over managerial decisions. That's all for now. I'll be back with more in half an hour.
the Sunday nightclub is your club. I'll take you inside the dressing room, from the terraces to the boardroom, to ask the questions you want answered. There is no membership required for the Sunday nightclub from Seven. Welcome back to Ty's Talk after a long break, but what an afternoon we have, because in the third hour of the show, I'm delighted to be joined in the studio by two amazing guests, some of the finest free-fall skydivers, to talk about an incredible expedition that they have just returned from. Just imagine, would you like to, to jump out of a helicopter um, at Mount Everest, 25,000 feet up, and land on a tiny tiny landing zone. Is that up for you? Then imagine that you're a double amputee who served in the British Armed Forces, you lost both legs in Afghanistan, and you're going to go skydiving above Mount Everest. Well, I'm delighted that Lee and Olga Winter here in the studio. Um, uh, Lee, you're a specialist military freefall instructor with the Airborne Forces. Olga, uh, you know, you're a, uh, a specialist and video videographer as well. Um, Tell us about this expedition. Uh, how many injured combat vets you took to uh, to Everest? Uh, it, how did it all come about? So we took four uh, injured jumpers, and then we had five trekkers that were that were trekking but not actually jumping. Uh, the original idea came about as um, we, we we decided to market the opportunity to to skydive at Everest, and then we were, we were approached by the Pilgrim Banders charity to see if we could do this for, for injured veterans, which is an amazing charity. We did a lot of risk mitigation and, and planning and decided, yeah, we, we, we can do that. Uh, and then we started, started the process. Absolutely remarkable. And during the course of this interview, hopefully we've got some, uh, some footage of uh, this. I mean, the idea of... Uh, you know, I did briefly learn to fly a helicopter uh, and then realised I was better letting someone else do it. But um, the idea of jumping out of a helicopter uh, at the height of Everest, I mean... What are the sort of the challenges uh, just of doing that skydiving? That's almost the highest in the world, isn't it, that's ever been done? That's o almost, yeah. The the drop zone, or San Mateo Airfield, is at 12,400 feet, uh, which is one of the highest landing zones for in, in the world for, for tandem parachutes. Um, and, and, of course, how many of you were in the helicopter? Because... Uh, um, uh, Olga, you were you were essentially doing the uh, the video, the photography. So you were sort of hanging on to the outside of the helicopter. Tell us about this. I mean, so we had sometimes three, sometimes four, depending if we had um, an additional uh, staff member with us on board. Most of the time, it was three people per helicopter: tandem instructor, the jumper, and my, either myself or my colleague Crassy. Krasimir Ilev was another uh, camera flyer. So for us, the challenge started from pretty much takeoff because we had to monitor oxygen supply for everybody, making sure nobody's getting hypoxic. So on top of our du normal duties of shooting good footage uh, for the customers, we also had to monitor that. And then our biggest challenge in that particular terrain was to spot because obviously tandem instructor couldn't do that. So we had to make sure that we exit that uh, helicopter at the correct place at the correct time above the drop zone or a certain distance from the drop zone, making sure that the winds don't blow us anywhere else. So that was the challenge in itself. So we placed a lot of pressure uh, on uh, ourselves absolutely. as camera flyers. I mean, that is extraordinary. And so um, you uh, and there's some, some footage of uh, other jumping at the moment. Hopefully we'll get to the actual uh, clip in a moment. But you were actually hanging out of the helicopter to take the first footage. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, just extraordinary. Um, and for the uh, for the guys themselves, how nervous were they? They were very nervous. Uh, we tried to mitigate that by providing them with a tandem skydive experience in the UK beforehand. We used that as a training material. And also we put as much equipment as we could possibly do safely. The environment, like we put oxygen mask on them that gave them the feeling of you know, a bit of claustrophobia because you're not used to sitting for 20 minutes, 30 minutes with your face covered and breathing yeah. heavily through, through a mask. So that gave them some sort of idea. But also, once we got to um, our drop zone area, we did a full-on training on the ground beforehand where we put all equipment on them and we did simulate it uh, the size of a um, helicopter and we simulated the exit, all the procedures that were going in throughout our climb to the altitude, like increasing the oxygen flow, changing um, 
oxygen systems if we needed to do so and so on and so forth so they knew exactly why there's yeah. so much movement inside the helicopter why we're touching the equipment what they're checking because if you don't explain that and somebody yeah. approaches and start you know touching your oxygen bottle or uh, your mask it's like why are you doing that what's wrong and that puts them under a lot more pressure so we wanted to make sure that they know exactly what's happening at what time and why we're doing it and i mean you know, as a double amputee harry in particular uh gurkha i mean just he, he, he's obviously he's totally reliant and they all are totally reliant on you as a tandem jumper absolutely uh, the I mean, some of the issues that, that, that we overcame were, were, were unbelievable. And that's, that's down to the guys themselves and how they come together. Um, we had Dean, who had a gunshot wound to the head. Uh, he had a severe um, dis loss of mobility down one side. Yeah, and you can see Harry uh, walking to the helicopter, double amputee, a Gurkha. There he is, uh, walking to the helicopter uh, to get ready for this jump i mean just extraordinary so that's twelve thousand feet uh, that's the landing zone the, the elevation of the landing the zone is twelve thousand yeah. feet yeah. it's just above namche bazaar um and and then uh, how long's the flight up before you jump out so it's a it, it's ranges between 25 and 30 minutes so we've got to put, have the oxygen system on the helicopter that can provide us with that with that supplementary uh, supply before we exit the aircraft itself uh, and there as you can see on the screens if you're watching it live you can see the helicopter uh you know heading up uh with the uh jumpers uh, i mean incredible scenery and um but, but you know flying a helicopter at that altitude is no easy thing either is it no no there was only one company who could provide specialized training pilots who could conduct that sort of who provide that sort of expertise for us who um participated in other events before who knew what is going to be happening because obviously if you have three people leaving aircraft on one side at the same time that that is challenging that is, for the pilot when you do that in a thin air and we can see it now we've got the video footage uh, the helicopter i think that's so that's you lee with um with harry uh, we just saw uh and just uh, getting ready to jump out i mean it really is extraordinary uh you know we're waving to the camera um, I mean, and there, and there, there, there he is. I mean, that's just, um, and that height. So that's about twenty five thousand feet up. That's about twenty five thousand feet where we exited the aircraft from. And, you, and as you can see, the challenges there are unbelievable with the type of environment that we're actually exiting an aircraft from. And 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 this is where we have to concentrate on exactly what we're doing and, and what we're what we're going to produce at the end of it. Just remarkable. And they did how many jumps did they do? Just the one. Two each. Uh, two each. Two each. Yeah. Over over a couple of days. Over a couple of days, we had three days jumping uh, in in that area, and that was that was to allow for weather and and some you know to give us a buffer so we can make sure we get the product in and and, 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 and this whole trip it was whose idea was it? So originally it was both of us. We, we kind of come up with the idea of of can we do this as a we, we were in a, a skydiving training company. Um, in, in anticipation of me, of you know, me leaving. One of those the conversations you have yeah. in a pub over a dinner. A mad like, conversation that leads to something. Mad conversation. You know, what do we do next? Well, this would be nice if we could skydive over Everest. Well, can we do that? So and you, then it started you came up with the idea, you organised it, and, and you organised the fundraising. No, no, it, the fundraising was done by the Pilgrim okay, Bandits charity, yeah. and, and we, we kind of supported that as much as we could. Um, yeah, we, we planned the expedition, organised it, facilitated, moved all the equipment, obviously provided all the equipment. So all the logistical support pretty much from start to finish. And, and so and, and the four um, uh, severely injured, I mean, Martin, uh, his tank was blown in half. The rest of his crew were killed. He had 75% uh, burns from this IED explosion. Uh, so he, um, uh, he pulled himself out of the driver's seat... Uh, he was then shot in the leg, you know, recovering from that. Um, uh, and he was uh, he was actually unconscious for four months. Yeah, yeah um, that's correct. You know, to go from, from, from that. And then Dean, as you say, he was shot in the head, uh, the only person to survive that's that correct. severe brain injury. Um, and then he lost an arm uh, because of that, essentially. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, this restriction of mobility on his uh, left side his left leg as well so it makes walking difficult and then when he has to walk in uneven terrain in the mountains at that altitude that's that's an achievement in itself achievement before in itself. even in jumping so um, and he walked for the whole day he did 
full on day trekking by himself, walking slowly as best as he could. Just and it's just remarkable. Just extraordinary. And then John Chart, um, uh, who had a uh, firefighter for twenty six years, had um, motor neuron disease. Um, so that's the first time, I think, the first time anybody with MND is... That's correct. Absolutely. And then um, Harry Magov, who was in the Gurkhas. Yeah. Uh, and was a double amputee, uh, again, from stepping on an IED. Um, he thought, you know, life was over, um, but remarkable. I mean, they must be thrilled. Um, it, what, what's next after that incredible achievement? So, um, we, we've, we've, we've planned the next next trip to a mountain range in, in Bovik in Slovenia, where we're teaching, you know, basic kind of zero to hero courses. We've also got another Everest trip planned uh, for this time next year. Well, really? April next year, which we'd like to um, get anyone involved into. Wow. Anybody fancy that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm looking at the production team. There's a lot of, <laughs> lot of uh, shaking of the head, I have to say. Um, <laughs> I'm, I might be tempted to go and watch. I'm not sure. I think I'm too old for it. <laughs> um, so that's next April. You're planning the so same that's again. that's next April, yeah. Right. We're also working with uh, the corporate uh, environment to bring in the, the things that you can get from skydiving and from, from exiting a plane, decision-making under pressure, just raising up to challenges and, and, and group building, which and essentially the whole process did. It, it really combined a group of people, not just... The Pilgrim Bandits and ourselves, but also our, our local guides. Uh, Absolutely the, remarkable. The, the team building that you get out of those exercises imagine. are pretty remarkable Quite because remarkable. everybody's worried, everybody's concerned to a certain degree, some a little bit less, some a little bit more, but everybody's in it together. together to they're the working same goal. together. Yeah. So, uh, one thing that was remarkable about this trip is because we were working obviously with Pilgrim Bandits, then we had the guys ourselves and we had our Nepalese team and how everybody came together during that time, everybody supporting each other, making I think sure that this happens. Absolutely remarkable. Um, truly, truly uh, hats off to you. And um, there we are, folks. Any of you fancy a skydive? Yeah. Uh, or indeed, if any of you have done skydiving, you know how hard it is, how scary it is, just at a couple of thousand feet. Um, in the English home counties, for example, the idea of doing it at Mount Everest. Um, but if you really fancy it, maybe you should get in touch and potentially sign up to the trip next year. Lee, Olga, thank you so much for coming in. Uh, remarkable achievement. Um, do pass on our best wishes. And keep us in touch. We'd love to hear about future trips. Utterly utterly remarkable. There we are, a good news story this afternoon amongst all the grim news, the tough news and the challenges. I'm inspired and motivated by that. I hope you are too. Stay with us. We'll take your calls. Lots more to talk about during the rest of the show. It's Ty's Talk here on Talk TV.
Welcome back to Ty's Talk, and I've just been chatting during the break with Leah Nolga. That was just... Oh, I enjoyed that interview. I hope you did too, and the footage. Uh, you can always uh, go back to it to look at it again, um, and I will retweet uh, some stuff out because there's extended footage of that. It's, it's utterly incredible, and they're going to be planning future trips, more trips, uh, and I think that I'll definitely stay in touch with them. Uh, but let us know your thoughts, your views. Have you done any skydiving? Uh, how ter if so, how terrified would you, or would you actually rather uh, stay on terra firma? Let's go to Burton on Trent, where Tracy is. Good afternoon, Tracy. Would you ever skydive from Mount Everest? Um, no. <laughs> I, used to hang glide, I used to hang glide years ago, so maybe that counts. Well, but, that's uh, that's pretty in brave. Youth, in the youth, in the youth. Um, well, I want to, good morning, Richard. By the way. Good afternoon. What's, What's on your mind? I keep thinking, we, we all kind of know what the problems are in this country. And it, well, anybody sensible does, don't they? The problem is that nobody seems to be held personally responsible for when they make mistakes. The government, the government watchdogs are absolutely useless. I mean, I know that from personal experience, trying to complain about my GP to the public health ombudsman. Um, I think what we need to do, the, the government can't do it. The government watchdogs are useless. Um, so I think what we need to do is maybe crowdfund the British public, crowdfund an organisation and actually bring to court and hold people legally responsible when they make gross errors, like with the North Eastern Ambulance Service CEO and senior management. Hold them responsible, make sure that if there is gross negligence, they're not allowed to work in the public sector anymore. They're not just allowed to shift somewhere else. They don't get their, their, help, their, their great public sector pensions. I'm thinking of Cressida Dick with Jean-Paul Des Desmondes. Yes. Yeah? The woman's just retired on a 100k pension. I think that is disgusting. And, and there's, there's, a, there's a balance, though, isn't there, Tracy? Which you, I agree with you that you know, you've got to, uh, people have, have got to be held to account... Uh, and, and we want people to perform. And equally, the other side of it is um, there's, a, there's a huge, particularly in the NHS, there's a huge yeah. culture we hear of, of cover-up yeah. and blame and always trying to, in a sense, they're so terrified of the mistakes they've made, they try and cover it up rather than accept it and learn from it. And I, used to, yeah, I used to work as a community pharmacist. And if anybody tells you they never make a mistake, they're lying. Of course. But what we used to do is, if I'd made a mistake, I was honest. Yeah, I've made a mistake. OK. Are you OK? That's fine. Let's see what we can do so it doesn't happen exactly. again. Exactly. And you learned and you shared that with somebody else. I read a book a few years ago about a American hospital that decided to take this approach because they were being absolutely drowned with um, litigation. So they took this approach, explained to people, yes, we've made a mistake. Yes, we've, we've looked into it. This is, this is what went wrong. This is how we're going to solve it out. Their litigation costs within one year of setting up the new system dropped by 75%. And I think, that's, I think that's really important because the NHS is spending an absolute fortune, I mean, billions of pounds. Billions. Uh, defending claims, making payouts. If it was sim it made simpler, as you say, yeah. we all make mistakes. And, and that would, in any walk of life, in, including yeah. in healthcare, yeah. if there was a, a greater willingness to say, I'm really sorry, we messed up yeah. terribly here, you know, this is the but appropriate this is level of compensation, this is what we're going to do, yeah. um, we're going to learn from it to try and make sure it never happens mm -hmm. again. And, and then, then there is, uh, you know, the accountability, okay, how did the mistake get made? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, was it because someone yeah. was being deliberately, was just being incompetent despite lots of training? Yeah. Can they be yeah. retrained? Um, yeah. I think that's a better way, and yeah. that way we, we, you get what yeah. I call continuous improvement. When, when I used to handle complaints when I worked before I retired, 99% of people, they don't want to stand there and shout at you. What they want is somebody to say, I'm sorry, OK, we've made a mistake, we're going to learn from it so it doesn't happen and, to somebody else. And, but you raised the point about Cressida Dick and, uh, you know, when she mm. was in charge of the Met, mm. The, mm. the problem there was that she never admitted when they mm. messed up and they messed up and they messed up again and again on some big operations and there was no-one held to account. And, 
And for me, uh, that's disgraceful. Mm. I mean, t- personally for me, when I was a pharma- community pharmacist, I'd have been struck off if I'd have made the same mistakes that Chris Dick did. Yes, and look, we all make mistakes, but what you want to do is learn from it and make sure you never make it again. And if you keep making the same mistake, then maybe you should be going and doing something else. But Um, I think we need an external... But I think we need something external to government to be able to do it, because the government... Yeah, as as long as, Tracy, it doesn't lead to more bureaucracy and more delays and cost. Um, Thank you so much. That's Tracy in Burton-on-Trent with some interesting thoughts about holding people to account. Uh, But... um, Let's head down from Burton-on-Trent to Maidstone, where Rosemary, hopefully, is patiently waiting. Good afternoon, Rosemary. Now, tell me, first of all, uh, would you jump out of, heli- out of a helicopter at 25,000 feet at Mount Everest? No. I've been in a helicopter, <laughs> but I wouldn't that. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> I'm not sure I would either, Rosemary. What's on your mind? Well, well, first of all, how right that last caller is. Well, wonderful, yes, what she was saying. Um, no, that's not what I'm meaning out for. What I'm meaning out for is, because I'm so old, I can remember gasometers in towns. You were talking originally about storage of gas. Yes. Well, there were great metal lumps stuck up there, and you could smell the gas if you walked by. We had some in Maidstone. And we also had them in uh, Brentford, where, where, you know, I also knew, had relatives that's there. That's right. Um, and, uh, you know, surely, if it worked then... I mean, there's no difference to gases. There, gas is well, gas. The, 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 I think the, the problem is, Rosemary, that as you say, all those gasometers have gone, and yes. it, they, they literally got rid of everything, even the last big gas storage facility, which was at Ruff, um, and yeah. uh, the government got rid of that, and and basically uh, they delegated it, outsourced the contract to uh, to the Netherlands. So we yeah. actually re- we've got days worth only of gas storage. Well, here we go again. Everything being halved, halved off to other other countries. I'm sorry. We should be doing everything ourselves. Of course we should, because as I said before, it's fine when the sun to... shines. Yeah. But when something goes wrong, and yeah. there's a shortage of something, do you really yeah. think uh, when there's a shortage of gas, maybe um, maybe in Netherlands uh, they decide to keep it for themselves or sell it to a, uh, someone else? Oh, uh, this is a possibility, isn't it? And 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 it's it's the same. I was talking earlier about. Uh, you know, being reliant on China for medical supplies, being reliant should, on Russia for gas, we just shouldn't do it. Should never have been allowed to have China have such leeway on the whole world over stuff. It's it's. Yeah, but com- the other thing I wanted to talk about. You know, we're talking about the ships that the the just, uh, the, um, just very quickly, over, Rosemary. Yeah, coming over the channel. Um, why can't we station ships halfway and turn them back there? Well, the, uh, uh, the, French waters still. the, the issue, French... um, you, 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 we can pick them up, but uh, the French no, wouldn't no. be very keen on taking them back, and we haven't got the courage to say uh, we're bringing them back until this stops. That's what they should do. No, no, we don't take them back, we turn them back, and then they can make their own way back. They'll still have fuel. Uh, yes, th- that, that's not going to happen. You've, got, you've actually got to, you've got to put them up, pick them up, safely put them in the boats, and then the boats take them back. Um, that's that's how it works. Rosemary, I've got to go to the break. Thank you so much for your call. Coming up, we're going to be talking about the new tube line opening. It's Ty's Talk on Talk TV. My friends had to describe me. I don't know, maybe you should ask them. But I think, or I hope they would say, I am the life and the soul of the party. I'll arrive, things get going, things get done. I'm a doer. They'd say that. They'd also say I'm glass <laughs> half full. <laughs> I look for the positive things in people's lives, in what's going on. But also, I think they'd say I'm passionate. I'm passionate about what I do, what I support, what I believe in. This is Talk TV News. Good morning, I'm Nadira Tudor. Government ministers are insisting that the Prime Minister has not intervened with the Sue Gray report. Boris Johnson remains under pressure to explain a secret meeting with the senior civil servant over her investigation into Partygate. The International Trade Secretary told Times Radio she has no problem with the meeting. With that meeting, to be very complete her report some months ago, as I say, uh, and that she should choose to discuss. I mean, she is an extremely robust and independent woman. I'm a great fan of hers. Uh, who she chooses to uh, speak to about uh, what she's going to publish is entirely up to her. Russian forces have continued their attacks on the eastern Donbass region of Ukraine following their capture of Mariupol. Ministry of Defense Intelligence say that the country's only operational terminator tank is likely to have been sent to the region as part of the offensive. 
Joe Biden's warning that everyone should be concerned about the monkeypox outbreak. The president of the U.S. says the country's looking into vaccines and treatments. Andy Burnham has paid tribute to the victims of the Manchester Arena terror attack on the fifth anniversary. The mayor of Greater Manchester thanked the city for the eternal strength and said the victims are forever in their hearts. Talk TV have spoken to Paul Price, who survived the attack, but tragically lost his partner, Elaine. The future is still frightening for me. Um, it's still, you know, there's so many struggles for me. One of them is loneliness. I've got lots of people to do stuff with, but I've got no one to do nothing with. And vote counting are still underway in Australia, and it's unclear whether Labour can get the 76 seats needed to secure a majority. Anthony Albanese will be sworn in as Prime Minister tomorrow. That's all for now. We'll have more in half an hour. Welcome back to Ty's Talk this afternoon, the third and final hour of the show. And we've definitely, this hour, focusing on good news, positive news. Uh, the uh, discussion with Lee and Olga Winter, uh, the freefall instructors about their trip and skydiving above Mount Everest with the injured vets, utterly uplifting for me. Uh, keen to get your thoughts. Don't worry, hold, don't hold back. Give us a call, 0344 499 1000. Would you skydive above Mount Everest? Uh, or any other concerns or thoughts or issues, frustrations. Um, now, the other good news that I just wanted to touch on, uh, and I've spoken to Christian Woolmar uh, earlier this year, back at the beginning of March, is the new tube line that's opening in London this week. Finally, I say finally, it, because it just, it's been a fair while, that is for sure. It's opening, I think, three and a half years late, but better late than never, surely. And uh, wasn't it wonderful, I mean, just joyous, to see the Queen last week actually formally uh, able to go to the line that's named after her, the Elizabeth Line, uh, and, and to open uh, a station there. Uh, that really was a great sight, uh, concerns over her health. Christian Woolmar uh, is a huge rail enthusiast. Christian, good afternoon to you. So uh, this, is, uh, this is happening, it's for real, isn't it? Have we got Christian there? No, we've lost Christian. There we go. Um, I was hoping that we're going to chat to uh, Christian Wilmer because also, actually back in early March, I had a bet with him. It wasn't a significant bet. Uh, it was for a pint of Guinness because he promised me that it would open in the spring and I suppose we could just about say uh, this is sort of, or well, maybe it's early summer, late spring. I, I think my bet was that it wouldn't open before... Uh, June, uh, but it does. You know, it is going to open uh, what was essentially sort of built as Crossrail, called uh, the Elizabethan, uh, the Elizabeth Line, and it is opening this week. Uh, and next week, if you have, have actually uh, been on the line, then of course you can let us know your experience. Uh, but I think it's fantastic. But it is, has cost a mere twenty billion pounds, three and a half years uh, late, uh, some four billion over budget, but a significant improvement to uh, the infrastructure. You can go from Reading in the west all the way uh, to uh, East London. And I think we have now got Christian with us. Good afternoon, Christian. Uh, good afternoon, Richard. How Sorry are you? So that's fine. Reasons. So finally, your book, which has had multiple, uh, multiple sort of um, uh, reprints and updates, the story of Crossrail Cross now is now, of course, the Elizabeth line. I think you've won your bet, Christian, because uh, I think I owe you just a pint about, of... I think I squeezed in, didn't I? I think you just about squeezed in. I definitely owe you a pint of Guinness. Right, good. I look forward to it. <laughs> so um, it, it is happening. And is it opening the whole length or just part of it this, uh, this no, week? No, no. Uh, look, the, the exciting bit is opening from Paddington to Abbey Wood, which is... Uh, Thamesmead in the middle of southeast uh, London. So it's not, it, there are trains running on the other bits, but uh, they don't run into the tunnel. So the, the only bit that runs for inside the tunnel is running between Paddington uh, and Abbey Wood. And that's because they still need testing. And as we discussed before, the computer 
issues are very complex, the signalling is complex and so on. So, but those will open either later this year or early next year. So maybe it's half a pint of Guinness with the rest on, uh, <laughs> on final <laughs> delivery, Christian. <laughs> so will you be, have you been on it yet, on a test trip, or uh, uh, will I've, you be I've a VIP a on, the, on the first day? Uh, I've been on a test trip. Unfortunately, I was speaking to you from Italy uh, because I planned a holiday. You see, I was too optimistic. So I thought, <laughs> oh, I'll plan a holiday for the last week in May because by then they'll have opened Crosswell and I've done the invite and blah, blah, blah. And of course, uh, I now won't be there on the first day. But I have been on test runs. And boy, is it exciting, which I'm glad you're being positive about this because, you know, yeah, we can moan about the overruns, we can moan about uh, the delays and so on. But this is something, you know, mega exciting. You know, this is an amazing railway. I don't know if you've been on it, but no, I, I, I have, do recommend I, to go. No, I'm, well, I'm really looking forward to I've seen, obviously, the stations being built, and I am excited. Uh, albeit, I did have earlier on the show Mick Lynch, the General Secretary of the RMT, and I am a bit concerned that um, uh, it may be very quickly on strike, having just opened. Uh, I, I don't think so. Um, I, you know, I think these people are very who've been training on it for uh, more than a year are, are going to be very eager to be uh, driving it. I, I spoke to a couple of drivers when I went down there, and you know they just think it is wonderful. And and it you know I've got very fast acceleration. The trains are huge. Uh, it's not going to be overcrowded for some time, I'm sure. Uh, the the stations inside are just astonishing. Look, just imagine this. It's three times the length of any tube station, 240 metres rather than 80 metres. You know, you can barely see from one end of the platform to the other. I mean, this is public transport like nobody has ever seen it. Um, um, that's fantastic. I can't wait to see it. I know the stations themselves are huge. So looking forwards, Christian, and I'm a, I'm a fan of uh, certain infrastructure... Uh, what about Crossrail 2, which has been talked well, about, but sort of maybe uh, put on the back shelf a bit? Uh, are you a fan of that, or, or is this enough? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, it's very interesting that Boris Johnson, he who actually ensured that Crossrail 2, which runs uh, sort of from Tottenham-ish down to Kingston uh, through central London, that, that kind of direction... Uh, 40 billion is the estimated cost, so it, it's it's even more expensive than uh, the existing Crossrail, but it will open up a lot of uh, housing and uh, potential jobs for people. Uh, Boris Johnson, he who actually cancelled uh, Crossrail 2 because uh, of the pandemic and uh, cutting back on TfL, then announces at, or when, uh, for, when, at the opening of Crossrail 1 that, oh, we must get on with Crossrail 2. Uh, so, I mean, you can't really trust unbelievable. what, what So, um, And do you agree with me, Christian, that we should be cancelling HS2 and instead go straight to HS3 uh, east to west in, uh, in the north of England? Uh, Richard, I've always advocated that... Uh, creating a, a proper network of railways in the north of England was much more important than linking them up to London. Unfortunately, so much has been built of HS2. I suspect that it would be a great waste of money not to finish it. But I've always been of that mind. What the north needs, and, and they should be doing this, given the levelling up agenda, is creating a kind of network southeast for the north. In other words, uh, fast electric links between all those cities that we know so well Newcastle Leeds yeah. Liverpool Manchester etc that that and I mean absolutely that of course then would create a proper rapid leveling up wouldn't it Christian absolutely that you know one of the things that you you see people moaning about what's wrong with the north and I'll say well there's a bus every every hour and uh, you know, it doesn't run on Sundays and I can't get to jobs yeah, uh, yeah. and so on. It would absolutely transform the region and it would send a message because all those trains could say, you know, transport for the north and they could be electric fast trains that people would be proud of. Fantastic. And it's such a shame that uh, well, they haven't that agenda. We'll keep battling on for that, Christian. Meanwhile, let's celebrate the good news this week of the opening of the Elizabethan, the Elizabeth line. Uh, that was Christian Woolmer, the author of Crossrail, and uh, some good news. Uh, we'll be taking your calls shortly after the break, 0344 499 1000. You know the number, and this is Ty's Talk here at Talk TV.
And welcome back to the last 15 minutes of my show, Ty's Talk. And we've got a couple of calls, but before that, just a quick tweet here from Neil. He says, uh, most of the refugee organisations receiving government money, 50 million, are far-left activists working against the government, against the public, and we should stop funding them. Uh, I think that is the thing. They may not be far-left uh, activists, but they are certainly, in my view, uh, left of centre. And I think they are working against the government and against uh, the wishes of the majority of the people. But let us go to Amersham, where Carl is there. Good afternoon, Carl. How are you doing? First up, before you uh, say your thoughts, would you jump out of a helicopter at 25,000 feet? Um, well, I had did a bit, uh, bit of parachuting in my youth, and I... <laughs> what a description. There we go. Um, what's on your mind, Carl? Uh, what do you want to talk about? Uh, mi migration or you want to be, uh, uh, the, the new rail? The new rail is an absolute waste of money. You've got the, one of the over-transported cities in the world. And now this chap who has an agenda, Chris Woolmer, wants to make it HS3 or Crossrail 4, Crossrail 5, just for, for fodder for his book. Oh, no, hang, hang on, just to be clear, actually, Carl, HS3 would be in the north of England. Birmingham, just have a cup of coffee. I don't see see the point in that. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not a fan of HS2 at all. The thing about, I mean, say what you say, but uh, before the pandemic, you know, the tubes are uh, incredibly overcrowded and busy at certain times. So, you know, Crossrail will have a, a big impact on that. And, you know, London is one of the biggest cities in the world. Yes, but uh, during COVID, a lot of people work at home, so they're becoming less crowded now. People have adapted by working at home. Ask any civil servant. They're doing very well working from home. They are indeed, but we want them back in the office, don't we? Well, uh, if you can work from home, why not? Three-day week, pay them less. Oh, well, I'm not sure they're very keen on that. Yeah, but my issue is... You know, no, we're getting it paid, my friend. There, there, is, there is a hybrid sort of win-win, but there is also the issue of are you being as productive? Uh, on a you know on a on a reliable medium term basis that that for me is the question about working from home. Yes, it's all very well, but if you don't work, you don't get paid. My job is if it's 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 um, performance related. My job, you know, it's like it's like soccer a football managers. If you don't if you don't win, that's <laughs> it. no, that's fair enough. But I think sadly in the civil service and uh, and I fear in the rail unions, uh, they're not very keen on performance related pay. They're not, and I would love 70 grand a year driving a train in a straight line, just putting on and off with a brake and accelerator. I would love that. And, and, and some quite long holidays, I suspect. Exactly, exactly. And a very strong union that, that sort of strikes at a drop of a hat. Thank you very much. But, but, but your view is that, so the, the new Elizabeth, Elizabeth line, uh, which was essentially was sort of uh, originally nicknamed Crossrail, uh, so you're not a fan, even though it increases the capacity and it runs from Reading in the west to uh, East London. Well, I could do that anyway. I could go to Paddington, get on the tube, and go to East London. What is this? But, well, then, but then you've got to change a couple of times, and it's going to and it's going to dramatically cut the times. Why do I want to drill holes in in London so it looks like a plate of spaghetti? Ridiculous. Yeah, there we are. Um, OK, Carl, you are not a fan, that is for sure, of the Elizabeth line, but maybe up in the north, it seems to me. Thank you for that, Carl, from Amersham, uh, who's also jumped out of a, uh, an aeroplane, done some skydiving. Lenny is down in Ashford. Good afternoon, Lenny. Have you done any skydiving in, uh, in years no, gone by? No, no, no. Quite, com uh, quite honestly, I haven't got the bottle. <laughs> Good for you for being honest there, Lenny. I'm not sure. I'm. I'm not sure. I'd want to jump out at uh, twenty-seven thousand feet either. No, mate. No, no, no. If the if the Lord wanted me to fly, He would have given me wings. <laughs> there we are. Well, it's almost like wings, but uh, there we go. What's on your mind, Lenny? Well, there's two things. One, I've I've been politically homeless uh, for a very, very long time. I've only ever voted Conservative but never have not voted for many years because 
my vote means something to me. Unless I can put my cross next to someone that I truly believe in, I cannot vote for them. And so uh, I hope that if you put a candidate up in Ashford, I would hope that I, would, I could vote for you, Richard. Oh, bless you, Lenny. Well, that's a good start. More good news this afternoon. It really is the hour of yeah. good news. Thank you for that. Yeah, and can I just ask you one quick question? Go for it. The, 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 the problem with our, the electricity, the, 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 what we are paying for our electricity, are Hoff Jim the main problem? They're not fit for purpose. Because, as I believe it, Ofgem are supposed to be the middlemen that the electric company doesn't make too much money and we don't pay too much for our electricity. And if that is the case, they have totally failed. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a really good question. And the answer is, is part sum and sum, uh, in my view, Lenny, because... Uh, yes, they have got to do that role of uh, preventing the electricity suppliers um, from uh, essentially profiteering and charging too much. And I think, in in a, in a sense, uh, they have failed, but they're not responsible for the generation, the production of electricity. And that was the failure of the government to ensure that we had sufficient diversity of supply, that we had enough of our own domestic-produced gas that we had enough uh, nuclear power stations that could produce reliable, cheap, uh, secure and affordable electricity. That, that's the fault of government over the last decade or so. Yeah, but if, if, Ofgem, if, if Ofgem had done their, pro their, their, uh, their job properly, then the windfall tax would not be needed. Yeah, no, uh, it's, you know, there's no question that they have... Uh, they failed to a degree, um, but I also think the, the primary culprit, for culprit, Lenny, is the government because they haven't, uh, you know, they've become too reliable on expensive renewables and imported gas. OK, well, I'll take your word for it and I will think on other There you are, Lenny. But, keep at it, keep calling, anyway, keep listening. Thank you. have a good day, mate. And you, Lenny, thank, thank you so much indeed. We're going to go from Ashford up to North Yorkshire where Emma is there. Good afternoon, Emma. Hi there. I thought it was morning then. I think this just gone so fast listening to you talking about Oh, everything. that's good. Hopefully you've enjoyed oh, it. Time flies when you're having I fun. I have enjoyed it. <laughs> there is just so much going wrong though at the minute. It just, your blood pressure is permanently high, unfortunately. Oh, I um, know. What's, uh, what's thing, winding you up most? Yeah, well, it's this monkeypox situation. Yes. <laughs> it's quite disturbing. Um, and also because the FDA in November 29 approved a vaccine for smallpox and monkeypox. And then last year, Gates was warning about a smallpox attack. And at the same time, the FBI launched an urgent probe after smallpox was found in the Merck facility in Philadelphia while cleaning out a freezer. And there's only samples that are supposed to be kept in Antarctica and Russia, interestingly. Um, and they also did a monkeypox simulation not long ago. So <laughs> is, your concern, is your concern that it's a bit coincidental? It's a, uh, it is, well, it's very coincidental, just like they did a simulation but, about COVID. You know, obviously, the small, COVID. indeed, and the smallpox vaccine has been around for a very long time. And smallpox yeah. is virtually eradicated, uh, as, yeah. as I understand. I think yeah. my concern, have you got any views also, Emma, on this uh, pandemic accord? Or, or possibly a treaty that the uh, the World Health Organization is very keen yeah. on and that they've been meeting on this weekend. Yeah, that, that's really worrying as well. And it just seems, again, very opportunistic that this is all kicking off just as they're wanting all these countries to sign up to this pandemic treaty. And one of, which, one of their main policies in such a treaty is the use of lockdowns, which we all know now are just utterly useless and don't do anything but make massive more problems don't save lives but take many more well, in it's, different ways i mean the collateral damage from lockdowns it sounds like you were uh, on my side of the debate on uh, the um, justification Huge. for lockdowns and Huge, yeah. you know i i do think that it, it does it does worry me this this idea that we would uh, cede public health policy uh, which is obviously the responsibility it should be the responsibility of a sovereign nation to uh, a unelected bureaucracy 
international bureaucracy, the World Health Organization, uh, which is what's being suggested. I mean, it, of course, it's a good thing to to coordinate uh, data, to coordinate experiences, and to share knowledge and best practice. I mean, that's a good thing. But the idea, yeah. Emma, that they they can then tell us exactly what to do and we're obligated to follow it, that's not a good no. thing. Very worrying, especially when it's led by somebody who has been taken to like the international criminal courts and has very dubious background. And as I said, you know, to have one policy is, is not great when you see how Sweden didn't go following the general policy and they actually came out better similarly with like Florida versus California. There's so many examples. Well, th th this um, is the interesting thing, isn't it? That actually uh, either individual states like in the US or sovereign nations like Sweden where they made their own decisions, uh, you know, in a sense, um, yeah. they were uh, quite contrary to the sort of the, the mainstream consensus. But certainly Sweden, they've actually suffered far fewer excess deaths in two years than uh, than we did. Yeah, and how do, how do the people keep the WHO, for example, accountable? You know, at the minute we, we struggle trying to hold our own government to account for the policies they make, trying to account for somebody yeah. that is generally propped up by Bill Gates somewhere in a cloud. It's just... It's, well, you, yeah. you share my concerns, Emma. Thank you so much for calling. That was Emma in North Yorkshire. Well, there we are. Uh, concerns about uh, the World Health Organization Accord, uh, but no concerns about the fact that for the next three hours, you should be hopefully listening to Trisha Goddard, who is uh, there ready and waiting. Hi, Trisha. How are you? <laughs> you don't want to know. You don't. <laughs> oh, what's. <laughs> I do want to know. Oh, You're ready, waiting, gonna... full of full of lots of stuff for us. Full of lots of stuff. Um, as Jake Daniels uh, is the first active footballer to come out, I'm actually interviewing Amal Fashunu about her uncle, Justin uh, Fashunu, who, who committed suicide very sadly and was the first footballer to, to come out. Yeah. We have our faith panel looking at stories in the news. We have our, our medic, our doctor, looking at the health news headlines. Um, so we've got a lot coming out. And dangerous dogs. The number of dogs attacking people has just gone up. What's going wrong? We're That's going to be looking into that. Uh, a whole, yeah, a whole lot more. There's been some very scary stories about 